Hey guys, man, I'm so excited. We have a great guest today. Uh, I get a lot of uh, requests for different people uh, that, that come on the show and I've, I've listened to this gentleman. I'm really excited to have another Southern gentleman on the program today. He's an extremely successful entrepreneur and businessman. He's made uh, tens of millions of dollars in the construction community and he's taken some of that information that he's learned uh, throughout life and he's uh, one of the contributors at The War Room with Andrew and Tristan Tate. He's also a coach at Hustle University and he is the former starting tight end at University of Louisiana Monroe when they beat Alabama in 2007. Please welcome Mr. Justin Waller. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, man. Good. Uh, listen, when, when I first watched some of the stuff that you were doing, one of the things that appealed to me is that you talked about gentleman game. Uh, I, and I, yeah. came, I came to a very similar conclusion that you did in a very different way, but I'm, I, want, I want to hear your explanation on this because you understand the, the contrapositive to that, right? It's a lot of red pill guys uh, that, that kind of get... get put into the wrong vector. They think, well, because women are attracted to status that therefore they're bad. No, that's not, that doesn't mean they're bad. That just means they're attracted to status. Let's just learn the rules. Can you, ex can you describe gentleman game? Yeah, so it's pretty simple. I, if I were taking you to lunch and I were trying to sell you something, yeah. would I not be polite enough to grab the door if I was in front of you? Would I not pick up the bill? Would I not talk to you about you instead of talking about me? It's human. And so when I look at these guys that go out there and they talk about, well, nag a girl or tell her she's not as pretty as, as she thinks she is, so she'll try to. It's really just, it's going to come off, even if she doesn't catch it, it's really just yeah. going to come off as insecure. I don't need to belittle a woman for a woman to want to follow or be with me. And especially, and I think most of the times, is like these guys, they think they have to be mean to a woman to set a frame with a woman. Yeah. But that's absolutely not true. Because nobody wants to be treated like shit. Yeah. What she needs to know is that you're in control of the situation. You're going to open the door. You're doing those things because you want to serve her in the way that a man and a woman interact naturally. But that doesn't mean you're a simp. And she can find that out by you having a very firm, strong, normal frame that shows you're in control. In fact, I believe that showing a woman emotion, especially in a way where like these guys are like driving or they want to yell at her or, or call her names to like try to suck her in. Yeah. I, actually think you lose control of the situation because of course, yes. you're showing a woman emotion. So she now knows that she can make you act like a child. And being a gentleman is being in control. It's taking the role of a man. It's taking everything in the relationship with conviction and responsibility and being that kind of, I, I always call it, be the mountain that her emotional waves crash mm -hmm. into. Yeah. She, they want that structure. You know, you know what's interesting? I, what I think the disconnect is this. When you have a lot of options, let's say you're, you, you, you have a seven-figure business and you're busy doing your business and there are several, you're a high-status man and there are several women that are interested in you. Your natural course of action to some women, you're going to come off like an asshole. You don't mean to be an asshole. When you see them, you give them their full attention. Yep. And what happens is she's not going to complain to her guy friends and her female friends about this guy who was an asshole. He was not an asshole. What happens now is that guy now translates that when he goes on some forums online. It's like, well, okay, that means I need to be an asshole. And now his incongruency, so now he's still living in his mother's basement trying to behave like the guy with the seven-figure income right. who um, the second with the seven figure income who has abundance of opportunities and it does and it's incongruent and women quickly quickly pick that out because here's the thing right from an evolutionary standpoint and this is one of the main topics on this show which you know as a man we have less to lose if we have sex with the wrong woman if a woman has sex with the wrong man and she gets pregnant let's go back 50,000 years she has, gets pregnant by the wrong man she has a lot to lose right so which gender would be better at like reading facial expressions or trying to suss out bullshit obviously females would so you the idea of you being incongruent to a woman who especially an attractive woman who's been approached thousands of times and by, lied to and lied to by thousands of times by thousands of men since she was 14 years old of course she's going to be able to suss that out and this is the reason why in general i think pickup doesn't work is because exactly what you said I've, look, man, I've been saying for quite a while now that I don't believe in pickup because, because it's really, it's really this, this hollow shell that's eventually going to get popped. She's going to find you out. She's going to find you out. So you might be able to trick a girl and sleep with her once or twice, but she's not staying. And so if you, it, it, a lot of these guys that come out there, they're not that guy. They go trick a girl into sleeping with him. And then he tricks her a few times until, until the truth comes out. He has feelings for her. And then she leaves his ass because he entered the relationship in a fucking lie. Good yeah. for you, bro. I hope that stings. <laughs> but, but it's also a really good opportunity to say, what would it take for me to keep that girl? Yeah. And it's becoming a better guy. It's really like I blame this whole scenario on weak men. Yeah. Because they want this cheap answer. They think they're going to follow some dickhead that's going to teach them how to say something mean to a girl and she's going to like them. Dude. 
It's bullshit. It's manipulative. It's a lie. And she's going to find you out in time because you can't fake being a high level guy in real life forever. Yeah. The, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come up and you're going to get outed and she's going to go and then you're going to call women trash and bullshit. Yeah. There's a fantastic book called The Coddling of the American Mind by um, Jonathan Haidt. He also wrote The Happiness Hypothesis. He talks about the Facebook app going on the iPhone in 07. And what happens is if you're in junior high at that point, you like literally lose the ability for interaction. I I'll tell you right, right now, I don't even have to ask you. I already know the answer to this. You come from a time and I come from a time yeah. where you would go to a bar and get in a fight and you'd go back the next week and no one would call the cops. Yep. It's fucking crazy. I grew up, yep. I, I was a bouncer in Austin, Texas in 1999, bro. We had brawls and the next day you were just cool. Like it, was, it doesn't right. make any difference. The, the, from 07 on, these kids have never, I'm not, I'm not condoning violence. <clears throat> what I'm saying is it was a different experience where if you had a problem with someone, it was an in real life interaction right. and then it was solved. And you could actually go back and being friends. When it's an anonymous interaction, when you start talking about my mom for some reason because I don't agree with you on Ukraine, then all of a sudden, now we're never going to be friends. And now you get into the situation where now the same guy has to confront a beautiful woman, has no idea what he's doing. You combine that with what, like what you said, uh, a pickup ideology, which is I am going to manipulate my way into the win. Right. So here's the here's the here's the difference, right? Uh, uh, where you might have a PO, PUA who's like, I am going to manipulate a woman to coming into my mother's basement and having sex with me. Whereas war room and men of action would be, let's get the fuck out of your mother's basement, right? right? Let's be Absolutely. that. You say you're not that guy. Let's be that Absolutely. guy. Exactly. And you're dead on about, about that fighting thing. I don't condone violence either, yeah. but I'm going to tell you this. It, it was nothing to get in a fist fight at a bus stop or saying, <laughs> okay, bro, I'll see you at recess. Yeah. There was actually, there was actually a repercussion yes. for what was going to happen. And I, I've been in plenty of fist fights and I've bled dude. And these guys, they throw these things and these words around yeah. and I don't like, I don't do that. I know the repercussions of physical violence. Like I've been in plenty yes. of fucking fights, dude. And, and it's a lot more serious than being behind a fucking keyboard. Yeah. And in regards to women, it's actually the same thing. I had to get off the school bus Go find a girl, try to find a trampoline to kiss her on or get behind the bleachers somewhere. Yeah. In real life, you had to approach her. You had to take that risk. Yeah. The, the worse, the easiest it was, which I, it's the old school tender, it's a check yes or no note. Yeah. You know, you drop her the thing at recess bro, and she's going to bring it back, is, man. That is a heart That's, pounding. Yeah, bro. It's old school tender. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Heart pounding. So yeah. uh, two things. I've heard these two statements. I've heard you make these two, yep. two statements before. Number one, she doesn't want you to cheat. But if you act like you could never cheat, like you are too fat or too lazy to even have the ability to, I think you're in trouble. And I don't think you should fight. Wes Watson came on here. He's like, I am a peaceful man because right. I can get, conduct massive amounts of violence right. and choose not to. You are not a peaceful man because you have string arms and kick a hacky sack and choose to be peaceful. Right. I am the one who is peaceful. And so I agree with that. Like, again, I served with a bunch of very, very, who otherwise would have been violent individuals yeah. in the military, and, and these people chose to be peaceful. And you're also not a good man just because you're not capable of right. violence. Like, yeah. I've, I've trained that stuff my whole life, and like I said, I've been pretty, that's the reason to be big and strong. It's the reason to do training. That just because you're not capable doesn't make you a good man. And in regards to cheating, it's actually the same thing. Just because you can't cheat doesn't make you loyal. Right. So let's let's cut the fucking bullshit. Isn't that, there's a bunch of women out there who legitimately yeah. think their man is loyal? No, their man lives in Des Moines and has no options. Right, right. That, that's essentially what's happening. Put, but, put, put but, your man on Charing Cross next to the Playboy Mansion, and then let's see how loyal he is. Well, hey, look. But the thing thing of the matter is, you could probably put that man in Des Moines over there. He wouldn't do shit because if me and you turn up, it's over anyway. Right. <laughs> and if you put me in Des Moines, I'm gonna get plenty. Yeah, I'm gonna run the block down. Me, I don't <laughs> give a shit. And and. That's that's the thing is like there's all these guys out there that'll run around acting like they're super loyal and that they're they'll play oh, oh I'm a man of God especially in the South man bro Jesus game is real <laughs> Jesus game is fucking I did real I not think we'd go to this place but yes you We're are good. correct I have absolutely seen this where yes. a guy is like I am a good man worthy of a good woman and right. he is. He, the difference is I'm telling the truth and he's lying. Like through his fucking teeth, G. <laughs> through <laughs> his fucking so, teeth. So you know what, dude, let's skip around because I, I didn't want to get to this, but like it, it is this thing where, you know, I'm 45, I'm almost 45 years old. And we got to a situation, you know, I spent seven years in the military. I'm, I'm like reliving my 30s now because I was, I was right. an officer in the military for so long. And now uh, going back through this idea of like, and it wasn't like even a bravery thing. It was one of these deals where like I was so used to being in like airplanes that were on fire or in situations mm -hmm. where we might die that when I started dating women after I got out of the military, it was like, I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. Right. This is this is a pre-brief for a, a mission over Afghanistan. Ready? Here's what's going to happen. I am not interested in right now in being in a traditional monogamous relationship. I would love to have you come meet my parents 
we could spend all this time together. I want to go to the movies with you. I would love for you to like bring your fucking animals over. I, I want all those other things. I'm just not going to be in a traditional relationship. And if you want to do that, that's fine. And I always expect him to leave. And what happens, Justin? What happens when you tell him the truth? Bro, for me, yeah, one of two things happen. Either they leave and come back in a week, yeah. or they just flat out fucking they stay. They fucking stay, they stay. Yes. And I'll tell you why, because they know deep, deep down that every man is lying to them, particularly the men that says, oh, I'm gonna be monogamous. Every man, every, excuse me, every woman knows yeah. that any man, if he could at his disposal do that, he would absolutely do it. And what women need to really understand, there's absolutely a huge difference between me being in love with you and sleeping with a woman. Yes. I could sleep with 30 women mm. and wouldn't want to hold any of them, take them on vacation, like find out what their dreams were and be a part of making those dreams come true or creating a better life for that individual. Women, I think, associate sex more with love as they have to. Of course, for evolutionary, uh, evolutionary right? reasons, exactly. Um, but am I a bad man because I'm telling you the truth and I'm just actually capable? Just like that fighting thing. Am I a bad man because I don't, I don't choose to use violence but i'm very very capable mm. you know or when it comes up i have and i have to use it am i am i wrong for using it yeah. so no man i think that i think that women really really appreciate somebody that doesn't blow smoke up their ass and yeah. so when you're that guy that has done everything right and you can look her dead in the eye because you're not scared of her i'll tell you a story i had a i had a girl that was very very close to i've seen her for a long time she yeah. told me that she had left her fiance because mm. he had cheated on her and i said no you didn't and she got really, really angry, we got yeah. quiet. About a week later, she calls me. Uh, we we're about to go on a date, and when she finally got there, actually, she called me on the way, and she said, look, what you said last week really, really, really upset me. Yeah. But you are right. I left him because he was too much of a coward to tell me the truth. Right. And I had lost respect for him in that way at that point. And respect equals love with women with everybody, with men. If you respect another, another man, you're much easier able to love him, you know, or at least have admiration for him in that way. So if a woman can't respect you because you're so scared of her that you're going to lie about sleeping with other women, then of course she's not going to respect you. How yeah. can she love you? Yeah, I mean, and the thing is to do it up front, too. Like, I, and it's yeah. really hard for a guy who doesn't believe that he has a lot of status to do that. But for me, it's just so much easier if you do it up front because it's almost like, I have guys ask me all the time because I had uh, uh, coffee and cleavage came on here. There's two playmates and they interviewed yep. me and they asked me about threesomes. And I was like, well, this is something you need to determine very early on in the relationship. I really don't like to bring this up later. Like right. very early on. Are you comfortable with this? Because it was like, uh, like it's, it's one of these deals where it's like because you weren't comfortable because you didn't do it in the beginning, you think you're going to talk her into it later. I think it's a bad idea. Just be right. up, but be up front with it. Right. You've ever seen uh, a military recruiter who might lie to you or a college football recruiter who comes in and yep. guarantees yeah, yeah. you that you're going to start. Yep. You know what I'm saying? At your position. At your posi Hey, shout out to Arch Manning at UT Austin. Yeah, yeah. like he guarantees you that you're going to start at your position and then you come to find out later, oh, maybe I've been lied to. It's better, I think, just to, just to take the loss and tell right. the truth up front, just in everything in life. Archie uh, Manning's a traitor. <laughs> Hook them horns, buddy. Hook them <laughs> horns. Let's get that money. Let's get, you know what? We're going to talk about UIL later. I actually want to talk, discuss that with you. Um, so, so now we're in this situation, and I, I really do appreciate the fact that, that you have. So here, here's I'm, this is how I came to the same conclusion you did. Right. I came here uh, from, you know, after being a uh, captain in the Air Force, I came to Vegas, and I met a, a lot of men who really looked at women like cattle. And I was like, man, what if there's a way? to be very successful socially, successful networking, successful having a social circle and successful with women without treating anyone like cattle, with treating everyone like with respect, like I was taught growing up in East Texas, right. okay? What if that was possible? And what I found was, and part of this was, you know, my friendship with Bulzarian and some other guys is, what, how far does pre-selection go, right? So just think of uh, my, my program, Men of Action, as like a, um, we think of it as like a, a laboratory. And uh, the scientific method, I should try to disprove my own hypothesis, right? right. Like Dr. Buss, should, absolutely. Like Dr. Buss does with his, his laboratory at UT Austin. And so one of the things I tried to disprove was, is there an upper level to pre-selection? Let me tell you, there is not. It does not end. If like, it, what I'm saying is like, there is no limit to where women are attracted to you because you know women, so you keep knowing more and more women and then they stop being attracted to you. Even Tristan would probably admit that, right? Because he, he has you know, several women that work for him that do right. uh, the webcamming stuff like that. Yeah. There is no upper limit to it. Bulzarian wrote, wrote a book called The Setup where he basically goes into a situation, I'm on a boat, a $60 million boat with 30 women who wanna have sex with me. And then it was like, this was the end. Like I, I wasn't happy. Like I would literally, I was at the point where like they never stopped wanting to be with me. Like no matter what, how many women it was, it was just, and it's just one of these really interesting things where I was like, okay, so what if I used pre-selection specifically that? And then whenever I went on a date with a girl, I was super nice. If I'm with a girl and we're having like an amazing intimate time together, 
I, I want to buy her flowers, dude. I don't yeah. feel I don't want to feel like a simp because I bought her fucking flowers. I like to reward good behavior. And if I'm having an amazing time with a woman, dude, I love, dude, I went with these two girls on oh, Valentine's Day. To, I took them both to dinner and then we have an amazing time afterwards. I don't give a fuck about paying for dinner. That's right. fucking, well, that was right. an amazing situation. Right. And when I hear these guys talk about simping, which is why I wanted to bring this up, what do you think about this where uh, <clears throat> there seems to be this like binary thinking, especially in pickup, never buy her a drink. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the opening the door is simping. You were the one who brought this up yeah, before. Yeah. I heard you talk about this. Before. I got attacked for it. Yeah. Can yeah. you can you go over exactly why you were attacked and like what do you think the the truth is there? Yeah. When I first when I first started making a couple of videos on the subject, I would get messages. They say, "Oh, you're blue pill or you're simping. You know, opening the door, buying dinner." I'm like, "No." I tell you, one thing I do is when let's say I'm on a first date and we're approaching our first door, mm -hmm. I'll stop and with conviction look in her eyes and say, "Don't ever open a door around." Mm, there you go. And it's oh, it, it's playful because she knows it's kind of it's kind of playful, but it's also creating this very strong masculine frame where, where she is set up now to be in submission, and that's in my opinion where every woman actually wants to be. All these women that are going out there saying I'm a bad bitch and I don't need no man and all yeah. this bullshit, they are fucking liars. They're almost the inverse equivalent of the guys that talk shit about women because they just can't get that kind of man. Right. And that situation with Dan that you were talking about. All those women were on that boat competing for mm -hmm. him. Yes. Which is what they've been doing for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. This, this idea of monogamy, how old? 100 years old, maybe? No, monogamy. So, so let's go back. This is a great question. So the Sumerians invented uh, marriage. Well, maybe they didn't invent it. Someone did around 11,700 years ago, which would have been the beginning of the, sure. the beginning of the agricultural revolution and the end of the Plasticine. Well, and that's what started monogamy. That's was, correct. Was so agriculture. So monogamy or, or marriage is a transfer of funds. It's basically a tax fee free f uh, t transfer of funds. And it's a way for nobility, rich people to maintain wealth within rich families. That's all right. it was for to hand this, down to their sons. This is also for those of you who don't know, this is the reason why bishops can't marry in the Catholic church is because they didn't want them to inherit wealth. So historically, that's that's part of the reason why. So essentially, this was a way that was what it was for. If you ever read Romeo and Juliet, people mistake that for some sort of like tragic romantic uh, uh, story. It is not. It is a tragic comedy where they're basically telling you you got to pick who you were supposed to marry instead of what your parents told you, and that was fucking stupid. And now you're both dead. That was the <laughs> that is the point of that story. He is not trying to tell you pick who you love. The idea of picking who you love maybe 1850. Maybe somewhere around that place where you started having uh, where people were not doing arranged marriages pretty frequently, maybe the last 150 years. And then what happens is Hallmark and Disney start making us believe that it was always this way. So they start telling us stories about um, Cinderella. Reality of the situation is right. Cinderella would have, you know, there would have been an arranged marriage. Like all of this stuff would have been arranged. And so we, we, we believe in this fantasy. And the reason why, and I don't want to get too far off topic, but I believe the basis is consumerism. I believe it's way easier to control a man when he's got two mortgages and two kids than it is when he's single making seven figures and, and loaded up on testosterone. And that's why the advertisement goes towards the women because the women spend all the money and the man says, okay, well, she wants that and I'm chasing the woman. I better buy it. And then he gets stuck. And I think Walt Disney has caused more heartbreak out of the misalignment of For expectation sure. than any man on the planet. Bro, it is it is really bad to it hold bad. it because you it because it's what you deserve. Going back to what the, the lie is, I will tell a girl, hey, I just want to let you know I'm not gonna be traditionally monogamous. I'm never gonna disrespect you, but I'm not gonna be traditionally right. monogamous. And then she's like, No, I met a male stripper in Thunder from Down Under. He's gonna be he told me he's gonna be my boyfriend and I'm like I like there's a little shrug emoji like Okay, yeah. let's see how this works yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. And like, I'll and see I, you in six months. I'll see, six months. Yeah, I'll see yeah. you in six weeks. Yeah. And like, and then they come back. Michael, I can't believe my male stripper boyfriend cheated on me. I was yeah. like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I try to tell you the truth, but you d believe that you deserve the fairy tale that Disney sold you. Right. And there is no fate, destiny, or karma. There is only probability, plausibility, and actuality. You get what you fucking deserve, or you make what you deserve. I, I was with my my clients. I always talk about Barry Sanders and Christian Okoye. Right, you remember yeah, Christian Okoye, yeah. right? Barry Sanders was he was talented enough to dance his way to the end zone, and Christian Okoye did not give a fuck if someone was in front of him; he was going right. to put that guy in the dirt. And that is that. Sometimes, as a man, that's the way you have to look at it. You will create the opportunities. You said before you kept showing up to a work site with your resume over and over again. You yeah. were Christian. You were Bo Jackson. You was like, right. I am so fast, and I am going to hit you so fucking hard that you are going to say yes to me. And that's how that's how I tell guys a lot of times as a man because you're judging your performance. You're going to have to do that, right? And so a lot of people. Like, no, that's not what I want. I get a soulmate and I deserve to be happy. None of us deserve <laughs> shit. Deserve has nothing to do with it. That's the thing that you have to understand. And that's the thing, like all of our programs where it's 
Brandon Carter, Greg O'Gallagher, you, me, whoever. Like the, right. our pro- programs are basically no one. The, can you go into no one's coming to save you? Basically, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, nobody is coming to save you, and I, I think that that's a message that we we've told guys. We we have tricked young men into believing that people care about their fucking feelings. Yeah, and. I believe that love has polarity. Mm. And what I mean by that is if I really care about you, I will risk you being upset with me and be able to stand in that fire with you to tell you the truth if you're fucking up or if you have a belief system that's going to leave you in shambles. And so I also believe that any person that loves passively isn't love at all. It's just simply selfish because they're too scared to confront you because of the counteraction of what they all have to deal with themselves. Yeah. And so the reason I say that nobody's coming to save you and I say it so loudly and almost in a way like I don't even care is because I really feel like we've told young men that if they try hard, if they will get their feelings hurt, otherwise it's all going to be okay. It is not going to be fucking okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is not going to be okay, bro. You can try your best. You can do as best. You can work as hard as you want. If you do not create results, you are going to fucking fail and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt bad. And don't let me be the one to love you passively. Fuck you. It's going to hurt. Yeah. Nobody's coming. So uh, I'm a big believer in the best day of your life is the day where you can really accept and realize that and smile because you know you want the ball in your court. Yes. If it's if it's game seven in your life. And you're not Michael, and you don't want to act like Michael Jordan. If you're not, no, give me the fucking rock. It's mine. Sorry. Of course it's mine. Yeah. It's my ball. Of I'm course. shooting the fucking ball. Nobody's shooting the ball for me. I want the ball in my court. Give me the fucking rock. If you don't feel that way, you need to go see the man in the mirror. Yeah. Have a long conversation. Identify whatever weakness that might, whatever fear that is, because nobody's going to fix it for you because I don't have time to give a fuck. I simply have time to tell you, little brother, that. I want to see you win, but until you look at the world through this lens, you will fail. Yeah. You will fail or get lucky and get lucky long enough to fail big. Because a lot of times, guys, let's say you start a business and you start and, and you just you, somehow, some way, boom, let's say it's an internet business and you think you're captain, 22 year old CEO, but you've never been through any struggle in your life and you go to invest in deal B and it's in a different industry and you get fucking wrecked. Nobody's coming. Nobody's coming. Yeah. And, and I think that the way we grew up, I think there's a huge difference between being born in, let's say, 85 mm-hmm. and like 93. Yeah. Oh, but it's a big difference. Yeah. Huge difference. Yeah. Because in 93, like you're, you're getting around to where you're in junior high and there's internet and there's yeah. social media. There's social I think media. There's, there's a big difference. So a couple of things uh, that you said that I think were, were really great. So first off, um, you know, for me, the moment that I realized no one was coming to save me was probably day three of survival school in, in the Air Force and Sears school. Yeah. And I'm eating this fucking rabbit. And I'm like literally eating ants. And like, I I realize if I don't make it through this, I am canceled as a flyer. Like this is my career and there's no one coming to save you. One girl fucks up her back. They have to send a helicopter to stretch her out. You are walking your way off this mountain. It's, It's 17 days and like you get no food and they're chasing you. And I just remember thinking like at this point, I'm like, if I can make it through this, I have no problems. You know what I'm saying? That's what I, that's what I, I know some people have worse situations that they're actually were in combat. Right. But like that, that was it for me. But here, here's two things that you said I thought was really terrific about nobody's coming to save you. First off, if you're a man and you want to like never get laid again, it's not hard. Correct. You can sit there and play video games. You can get fat. You can have no, you can not go out at all. I promise you, it is not that difficult. You will never have sex with another woman for the rest of your life. Women are not going to feel sorry for you. No one's going to start a GoFundMe and, and right. karma and fate are not going to step in and find someone special for you. It is not going to happen. Right. You are going to be judged on your performance for the rest of your life. And here's the other part of it too. Because she cheated on you and is now on a yacht in Biscayne Bay with a rich man, karma is not going to fuck her over either. Nope. There's no revenge on her. This is no. something the, a lot of these red pill guys need to listen to. There's no karma on her either. She's just fine. Don't worry about that. We have a saying in MOA, and it's specifically from that situation Michael Jordan said when he was talking to Ahmad Rashad. Yep. They talk shit, and we score 63, right? They talk shit. Sam Smith was talking shit. Michael Jordan, he, he doesn't give up the ball, all this kind of stuff. Then he went in that game, that game against Boston in 86 and scored 63 points. And after the game, you remember what uh, Larry Bird said? He said, today, God was on the court, and he was, he was disguised as Michael Jordan, yep. right? That's why I tell people, they will talk shit, and I will score 63. I do not respond to people when they hate on me. 
I just do better. And that's one thing that I, I saw from you. Again, when you realize nobody's coming to save yeah. you, that's where you get to that situation. Uh, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willick is my favorite book on no one's coming to save you. It's your fault even when it's not your fault. It's always you your fault. You have to find a way. Yes. Because if you don't find a way to make it your fault, you've now given up control. Yes. I, I, I actually say this in quite a few of my videos, and I, I'll give you an example. I used to get upset. I'd be like 24, 25. I'd hire a guy. Mm -hmm. South Louisiana. Yeah. It was probably on meth or some shit. You know. so, so let's reset this. You're in construction business, and we're talking about trades people. Right, trades guys. Yes. And, and so I, w I would schedule them for me to go to the job site, and they would either get fucked up or whatever, not show up. And it would happen, and I'd keep hiring the same guy. I'm like, no, man, you, you need to show up for work, et cetera, et cetera. And one day it just hit me. It's like, dude, if I don't find a way to create a recruiting system mm. where I can really pre-vet these guys and somehow get a guy that's not going to be on drugs shown to my job sites, you know, because I, I didn't know in the beginning they were on drugs, but I kind of over time, it, it kind of started to dawn on me because I was a little naive because I was yeah. so young. And and I've, I've always lived the rest, of, the rest of my life and the rest of my career, I've lived that way. If anything happens, I don't give a fuck who did it. If somebody makes a mistake in the field, it's a system that I should have built. Yeah. Now I can build it. If it's a guy that doesn't show up, it should have been recruiting. If it's somebody that doesn't pay me, then I should have had better payment terms, whatever it may be. But if I give away the responsibility and the control of not blaming it on myself, I will always be subject to that problem. Yes. So I absolutely agree with you 100%. Yeah, no one's got, like, it doesn't matter if it's not your fault. No one else is going to fix it. Right. You. If Nobody. You, again, this is for, for let, let, me, let me caveat this. Those of you watching this who want a scalable seven or eight figure business, the rest of you, you probably don't need to listen to this. But those of you who do want outrageous levels of success in your life because you're willing to work for it, not because you think you deserve it, then you should be listening to this, right? Let's go, let's go back to this. Also, the thing I really liked was like the new problems. We hired nine people this week in my company. And I was Hell like, yeah. yeah, I was like, like we were going over we had a lot of people apply that just weren't qualified, right? And I was thinking about some of the stuff you say, I really like people who've gone through my program coming to work for me. I'm a big fan of that. Yep. Uh, acolytes, right? People, yep. again, like uh, your salespeople at the war room should probably be people who finished the course, right? And so, um, and the, the, the thing you started talking about is as you grow bigger and got more responsibility and more wealth, yep. you're like, I like those kind of problems. Can yep. you talk about the, the beginning yeah. kind of problems and then the later the success kind of problems? Yeah, man, in the very beginning, I, I, I remember having $2,500 payrolls. Mm. And, and it would stress me out. And I, I remember I, I had a couple contracts. Actually, I went to the bank and I'm like, hey, I need a line of credit. And they're like, well, we can give you $7,000. I'm like, the fuck am I gonna do with $7,000? You know, I just want two more jobs. I might have to have two crews. It's never gonna work, blah, blah, blah. And so she's like, well, you could go get more contracts and bring them to me or whatever. And so um, it was, Actually, I lost my train of thought. We're probably gonna have to- uh, No, no, it's fine, it's fine. So what we were talking about before about having those big time problems, right? Oh, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so um, my, my favorite quote in life is, you can tell the size of a man by the size of his problems. Yes. And I think that creates the most healthy relationship you could ever have with problems. So I'll backtrack into my business. Early on, I would have $2,500 payrolls. And at the time, it was a huge fucking deal to me. Yeah, it really was. For sure. So much so that it kind of made me nervous because I knew I had to pay for equipment. And then in construction, you know, you might be net 45, net 60, easy. And I went and I asked for a, a little line of credit. And they wanted to give me 7000 I ended up getting like fifteen, And as I got bigger and bigger and bigger, and the problems got bigger and bigger and bigger. And today, like $100,000 a week in payroll at my company. And... I have to tell you, I'm super proud of that fucking problem. And so you can look at a guy who can't pay his light bill, and that's kind of a lame-ass problem. $100,000 a week payroll, that's a hero-type problem. Mm -hmm. And every man that watches this show or watches anything knows or should know that he's playing the star character in his own show. Mm -hmm. And without big problems, the movie's going to suck. So for that reason... I like to remember that you can tell the size of a man by the size of problems. In fact, when big problems come to me, I say, that's my kind of fucking problem. I yes. get excited about it because that's the next level up. It's a next level up because all you're doing in life is solving a bunch of damn problems. So as a man, you need to go find problems and make sure they're fucking big. Something that you can remember. Something that when you're sitting in that rocking chair at 90 years old, you can be like, bro, I was a fucking G. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I was getting after it. I had big problems. I had real shit going on. Not this bullshit. I couldn't get one date or pay one light bill or pick up a tab. So get big fucking problems. That makes it more fun. It makes it exciting. It makes you feel alive. 
there, there's nothing better than having big problems. And it changes your relationship with stress. Yeah. Because you're going into that next phase where you have to stretch. And that's normally where the pain is, right? But if you can have that relationship with problems being bigger, you can kind of smile at that's, that's a type that's a type of meditation. Honestly, yeah. like being able to deal with that level of pain yeah. and stress and then and then reframing yeah. it. Uh Jocko Willick says the word good, right? So whenever it's like, hey man, uh the the orders didn't show up on time, good. He's yeah. like, hey man, we just made an extra million dollars. Good. It's like no matter what happens, because right. it goes both ways, right? When we do awesome shit, one time we I went on one podcast and we got a bunch of new clients from it. And I was like, good, but guys, I'm not gonna go on that podcast every week. So I'm not gonna get too excited about the extra money we made. We need to keep grinding. We need to make sure paid advertisement works. We need to make sure organic works. We need to have, just like on Madden, you remember on yeah. Madden, you had the speed, uh, acceleration, <laughs> awareness, right? I need it's all of them, time. we need all of them up to 99, right? We need all of them up to 99. So right. I was like, so, oh, we did good, good. Oh, this shit, horrible thing happened and somebody walked out on us. Somebody tried to steal my entire program. This happened one time. Somebody tried to steal my entire program, like screen cap my entire program, right. good. Good. I guess somebody, you know, I'm doing all right. But that's the thing. It's like your it changes your relationship with stress when you can just say good. In your case, I like those fucking problems, yeah, right? I, 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 I absolutely love it. You remember uh oh gosh, Mike Singletary. Remember he played for the the Bears, the middle linebacker. He goes, I like this kind of party because he was going yeah. he was going to He was later. coming to wreck shit. He was coming to wreck you. Yes. And it, trust me, it hurt him too. Yes. Like Mike Singletary felt some pain too. He was like, Oh, I like this kind of party. Here comes this violence. You know, that's a really good segue too, because one thing I also use and I want to say is that every time something negative happens to me in one of my businesses, I think about the fact that somebody weaker than me, that is my competition, is also facing that same problem mm. and their bitch ass is going to quit. And so when you had to come through and meet me in the hole in a game or Mike Singletary in this, and Mike Singletary knew that too, like it's going to hurt both of us, yeah. but it's going to hurt you more, motherfucker, mm. because up here... You're not ready. You're not ready to take on that kind of pain. There was no. There was no way to mentally defeat that man. Right. That's why he was one of the greatest middle linebackers who ever played. And that's the point. I think that's the most important thing to remember about life. I don't know that I'm the smartest person. Right. In my industry, but I know this. I'm tough. I'm tough as fuck. And I know I've seen plenty of people quit, and I've seen plenty of people go out when they didn't get paid. And I'd much rather be tough than intelligent. Mm -hmm. I hate to say it. But that's, that's something they have to know because what ends up happening is you take enough hits over time, you, ev you eventually start to slip that jab. Yeah. And then, and then you might take the cross. You might take the cr cross twice. Yeah. But eventually you're going to roll on top, and that's when you get your licks in. I'd also rather be tough than be a hater. Like, oh, I, yeah, I, me too, man. But, but I, I, too. I, I had some dude come key my car. Or it was actually a girl. I know who it was. Uh, come key my car because she, I'm not going to go into the reason why, but I was like, I, I've made a video about it. I was like, I would way rather be the dude getting my car key right. than the person running around parking lots keying somebody's car because, man, you are suffering. Whoever you are, I forgive you. Yeah. Whoever you are, there is no way I can make up for the pain you must be yeah. going through to come key my fucking car. Yeah. Everyone knows where I live. Everyone in the city knows where I live. So, like, I'm right. not this surprised. I'm surprised it didn't happen sooner because of some of the right. shit I say on this podcast. But, yeah, that, that was interesting. My favorite quote, you talked about your favorite quote yeah, yeah. about my favorite quote, or not one of my favorite quotes, is Elon Musk saying, you will be paid in direct proportion to the complexity of the problem you solve. And you talk about becoming valuable to other men. Can you talk about that as far as like something you need to do as a man in order to, um, in order to make money, to become successful? Yeah, absolutely. So when, let's use construction, for example. People wouldn't use me if I couldn't hit their schedule. You know, in fact, when they, when they talk about value, let's talk, I'll, I'll transition it to construction and sales. I'm not always the lowest person to give the price to, to build the steel building. But they look at the project and they say, okay, well, he's a little bit more expensive, but I know he's going to hit, he's going to be good on safety. I know he's good, going to be good on quality. And probably most importantly to them is I'm going to be good on production. So I'll take his price at a little bit more money, but I know the overall value yes. of using his company is going to allow me to get a roof on the building, which means I can start the framers, which means I can bring the electricians in and the HVAC in, and I don't have to worry about the roof leaking, so we're not going to start getting sheetrock wet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, I've had those problems, but we created systems to get past them. But the point is the overall value of him is going to be better in the long run. And I think that's true for all men in all industries. People, especially when it's just men and men, yeah, if you're a woman and you're beautiful, you don't need to do much. But as a man, you better perform or they're just going to kick you out the fucking tribe because every man is trying to independently win and he has no problem teaming up and being loyal and being accountable and being trustworthy to another man fully with loyalty as long as that man is creating value for the overall team so they all win. Yeah. I tell people all the time, I don't want to be friends with you unless we can make money together. Right. 
And a lot of people don't like that, but I don't give a fuck. And I'll tell you why. It's because if you I... You only have so many spots to be friends. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And the list is short. Anybody that thinks they have more than three to five friends is probably has zero fucking friends. Right. That's a good point. In addition, if I really love you, if I really love you as a man, I want to see you get rich as fuck, have a wife or kids and a whole family that have a life incredible, far beyond anything they could have ever imagined in their life. All because of you. I want you to be the fucking man. Yeah. And if we can't do that together, I'm not interested being on your f- fantasy football team, bro. I have no <laughs> fucking interest. Fuck, right. Fuck you, bro. Yeah. Let's make money or let's go different ways. Yeah. That's beautiful. So it is what it is. And that's another reason, like, like if, let's say you have a girl. Like, just because I'm sleeping with you doesn't mean that I'm going to be friends with your girlfriend's boyfriend. Fuck right. that shit. Like, I'll, hey, shake hands, be cool, but we ain't hanging out, bro. Yeah. We're not hanging out. Unless so, you got a deal. So so I uh, I have this, uh, this speech I give to everyone I work with, uh, and it goes like this. I goes, hey, man, if you slept with every girl I ever had a crush on and that I'd, I'd never met before, uh, and you made $10 billion, I will never, ever fucking be mad at you. Never. I don't care how successful. I need you to understand this. For some dudes, it's like, yeah, that's obvious. No, not here in Las Vegas. Not in Chicago, not in New York, and not in Los, Los Angeles. They, these guys want you to be successful until you are 1% more successful than them. Then they don't want you to be successful anymore. And I make this, this I want my partners and I want my, my salespeople. You're talking about $100,000 right. payroll. Yeah, yeah. Bro, I would love to pay my salespeople $100,000. Yeah. I'd be so fucking excited to be paid. Again, this is the difference between the people I used to work for and the ones I work for now. I am so excited for my people to get paid. Rule number one in my core, and, and we have like a little... Two rules in, in my in my business, inside the business, rule number one is everyone get paid, gets paid on time. Rule number two is anyone messes with your commissions, they're fired immediately, right? right. Because in this self-help coaching realm, there's a lot of this, I oh, I'm not going to pay my salespeople or I'm not going to pay my coaches and these kind of scams that go on. Right. And I'm like, we're going to avoid that. Right. Like you talked about, uh, my 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 construction crew will be safer. We will have, we'll, we'll have a, you know you're going to get better quality. That's the main thing. Right. I don't know if you ever read the story about Lee Iacocca taking over, um, uh, taking over Daimler Chrysler. All he did when he first got there was just make it so there were zero deaths on the assembly line. He, all he worried about was safety. And when he did that and then went back to the union for negotiation, they actually realized, wait, this fucking guy cares about us. Holy shit. Like all he cared about was this one thing, this one piece of quality. But this whole idea of like never being jealous, because you talked about this with Tristan, you know, like no matter how successful he was, you're so happy that he's successful. Bro, this every is day. A, this is a very difficult thing for a lot of people to understand because unsuccessful people really think that we're just stepping on each other's necks in order right. to make money. I would never, dude, I want Brandon Carter to be so, I want Gregor Gallagher to be successful. Right. I'm so excited for these guys, Nick Cosman, all these guys that, that, are, that, are, that come on my podcast that I'm friends with, that I, that I want them to make money. Even if we, we are in different businesses, I'm so excited for them. And then when they do that, I'm never like, well, I've lost a piece of the pie because it's never like that, bro. People who have a really good ex- experience with my program tend to buy other programs because, my exper- because their experience with my program is that that they received a massive amount of integrity, right? So I, I love that 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 you said that. The main, the other thing I want to talk about is you mentioned before about following your passion, yeah, and how necessarily that isn't the greatest idea. You need to create value instead, right? Can you exactly. talk about that? Yeah. So it's it's really important. There's there was this time I got asked. There was a girl I went to college with. She asked me to come speak to some kids at a school, mm-hmm. and I'm sitting there in the hotel room. I'm kind of looking over my notes and stuff like that because the whole pitch was like go to college. Yeah. And she's like, hey, would you mind sending me the notes? And I'm just like, no. And so it hit me that night that the whole, you know, obviously the, the whole thing was bullshit. And so um, I went in there and I said, listen, do whatever you want as far as college, but let's talk about following your passion. Sure. Following your passion is absolute bullshit because that, because look at it like this. I like to work out. But if I thought that because I like to work out that I'm going to go be a personal trainer and then up spotting people all day, I've lost my fucking mind. So I found something. The, the way you find passion is that you go through pain in something so much that yes. you become competent. And once you become competent, you get to walk in a room and help people in a real way when they otherwise would not have been able to do it. Then you become passionate. So you go through pain to get to competence, and then you find passion and fulfillment and being able to help someone do something they otherwise could not have mm. if you would not have suffered through that pain. But most people do it the other way. They start with the yes. passion and then they, they start they, with the and passion. Then, and then they end up like trying to start a, an OnlyFans management agency with right. no experience or whatever. Yeah. Or they're selling Bitcoin and they, and they have also, no idea what they're talking about. And they fail. And they fail. And, they fail. and yeah. I think that's a, another really outside of 
not understanding how businesses run and having entrepreneurial seizures and not understanding systems, et cetera. I think that's another reason businesses fail yeah. is because they start off with this pie in the sky idea of something they think they like to do. And then they realize that actual thing they like to do is only one X in an overall formula that actually makes a successful business. And you could take that X out and put in Y and, and most businesses will run pretty well. And so they think they're going to do this one little thing that they think they like to do, et cetera, et cetera. And then they get burnt out real quick when AR is too high, mm -hmm. accounts payables late. They got people not showing up for work. They don't, they haven't built a culture and they haven't built any systems and they just get wrecked, overwhelmed. And then it's over. Yeah, it's over. We'll follow your passion then. They, they follow their passion yeah. and then they don't want to, because they don't want to work. They don't. That's what they think it is. Now here's, here's the thing, right? In Scottsdale, Arizona, every yep. year there is a huge golf tournament called the Waste Management Open. The guys yep. who own Waste Management are billionaires. Okay. So I want to ask you guys a question. Who here thinks that these guys woke up one morning and say, you know what my passion is? To clean up shit. To, to yep. clean diapers. To take massive amounts of human fucking waste yep. and to put it into dump. This is what they wake up, man. No. What, the, what happened was somebody woke up one morning and were like, how can I make other people's lives easier? <laughs> And because they did that, they have a billion dollars now, and now they have a fucking golf tournament named after them because they didn't follow their passion. They f saw, like, some, no one's passion is to clean up shit. No right. one's passion is that. Right. So somebody figured that out, and they had, dude, the most successful bar in Dallas, it was this fucking Tejano bar where they had dollar beers. I don't want to own a Tejano bar, but I would like that money. That guy who <laughs> was owning that bar was making a fucking ton of money, bro. It was like a line down yeah. the street. It was like, this is not my type of music, but I would like this money. Right. This is fucking right. awesome. I don't need this passion. I would very much like this. Don't. It's not about following your passion. Right. To, the, to your other thing. Um, I've, I've landed, I, you know, I probably have several hundred landings in like a Cessna 172. When you, after you do it several hundred times, you get this feeling in your ass, like right before you land, when you bleed off the airspeed and then you, you put the, the main gear on the ground. You get to trust your instincts after 200, 500, 1,000 landings. You get to trust your instincts after like 500 heart transplants. You get to trust your instincts after you've hired 700 people. Then you get right. to trust your instincts. Before, when they're like, oh, I'm going to check my zodiac sign. What does my horoscope say? That is not the time to trust your instincts. And it's very difficult because when it comes to your passion, fuck your feelings. Yep. Your passion is not what's important. Like you have to leave, your, especially dude, if you're a man, you have to leave your passion behind because you're not special. None of us are, dude, unless you're 6'9 with a 42 inch vertical and you play small forward for the Lakers, none of you are special. Like you are legitimately going to have to work. And so you need to understand what is the problem I'm gonna solve for other people. Then at some point you grasp it, 10,000 hour rule. You grasp this level of mastery. Now you can be creative. Now right. you can follow your passion. Now you can do what I do and I like I rescue animals. That's like my secondary right. passion besides my business. You can do those kind of things, but you cannot do that in the beginning. And so many people, they hit me up and they just want this easy easy answer and it's just so difficult i'm sure it's frustrating for you no man and you're absolutely right and another thing i would add to that is when it comes to your passion and making money and and you saying like you'd buy that bar mm -hmm. i always say my wrist never hurts when my jumper's on yes you know what i'm saying <laughs> give me the ball yeah give me the fucking ball like yeah. like please give me the ball so if you're in a business that is not sexy yeah. let's say steel yeah Hanging steel, all over the hanging steel in northern Louisiana in the summer. How about that, bro? Fuck that, shit. bro. How about you, that? How about, how about being a roofer in my home? My homeboy is like a millionaire roofer in fucking Nashville, bro. Tennessee in the summer. I'm telling you, bro, it's hot. And yes. on a metal roof, it's like a, it's like, it's like it's like working in a frying pan, man. Yeah, it's like working in a frying pan. But the point is, is that the business doesn't need to be sell, uh, sexy. You know, you you think that you're going to be passionate about it. You're not. But I tell you, you get real fucking passionate when that check hits every yes, week. for sure. Or, or you're getting paid and you can live a life that you want. Yeah, you get real passionate about still building Zen. Yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So in, in that regard, I, I, I completely, uh, completely stand by that statement because, you know, you could pick between doing something you think you like and something that makes your life an absolute dream. And you're going to have to go through some pain, but I think that pain's going to be worth it. I wanted to do YouTube for a very long time, mm. and I would not let myself until I had a liquid M in my bank yes, account. Yes, that's a good point. And I think, that, I think that we're in this weird time in history where they allow people to go on the internet and lie. Bro, they, that's I, all they do is lie. I think that the day is coming, or it should come, where somebody should have to verify a certain status financially before they go out giving business advice to young men. Yeah. Because I think it's toxic and I, I think it's misleading. And I think a lot of people are making money off of repeating a bunch of shit that they saw on the internet that yes. they have never actually done. You're correct. 
That, that's it, one of the. I'm so insecure about that specifically. It's why oh, I'm you, super insecure. Why about you it. consistently see me hosting not a big bikini competition, the biggest one in the world. It's why you consistently see me posting huge guests on my podcast. Is because it's yeah. not because I'm trying. It's not a flex. It is to show you I am not that scam artist you just whose program you just bought who tell, right. tries to teach you about money and doesn't know anything about money. I was an actual quantitative analyst at an actual hedge fund. I will show you the numbers. I will show you my returns. I consistently try to show these things. Like me in the gym, me out with my right. with the girls, my birthday party. <laughs> you, you'll love this. They all wore burnt orange to my birthday. It was 54 girls showed up for all my right. birthday. I'd, I'd probably show up to me, me, All right, hook them. 54 Fine. Hook girls. Em. Hook them. Uh, hey, go Warhawks. Go Warhawks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Bulzarian and then fucking uh, Steve Aoki show up. And we did that and, and, and in that situation. I didn't, it's not a flex. It is to show you unequivocally. And then the other thing is my right. clients. There's 50 testimonials on my, on my sales page. The other reason is because specifically what you said, there are so many liars, bro. If you just tell the truth, it's funny. If you just tell the truth in sales and like don't overpromise, it's incredible how you can yeah. have a long-term connection Absolutely. with your clients. And by the way, if you're just not creepy with women, you'd be surprised how far that will yeah. also take you yeah, because yeah. You're, compared, you're compared to a bunch of men who cannot look at women in the face, and then when they get angry, they, make, they call them names on forums. Right. So you're exactly right. Just If you could just be competent, right? That's, we're not even talking about excellent. Right. We're talking about just being competent in some of these areas. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with that in every way. Yeah. Um, can you talk about uh, Cobra? To, uh, Andrew, Tristan, and uh, Sterling. Is that his name? Yeah, Sterling. Yeah. Can you yeah. talk about your relationship with those guys, what it is that you guys, how you met them, and what you guys formed together with the War Room? Yeah, so look, for me, in my life, I had handled fitness yes. and, and money and all these different things, and I had these feelings inside of me about particularly monogamy. Mm. And and I was still in, I'm still in Louisiana at this point, in Baton Rouge. Where, where are you now? I live in Miami. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, my business is still back home, so I fly back and forth. But, you know, I had I had these thoughts on these things, and I knew I'd grown up in a small place, and it started to feel like I was going to, you know, I wasn't getting invited to gender reveal parties, yes. you know what I mean. Yeah, you know I don't really get invited to many. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, maybe. Yeah, 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 I don't know. So, so I'm in this place where, you know, I'm growing as a person, but I kind of feel like I've maxed everything out, but nobody understands me, you know. And, and so I couldn't, I couldn't no longer tell my friends, hey, man, Somebody owes me a million dollars, you know, because they were having trouble like paying their light bill. Wow. Yes. You yes. You know what I'm saying? This, so is, this it, is a light bulb here. You yes. can grow into this very lonely place. Mm. And so it becomes harder and harder and harder to find men that not only you can go back and forth with so you don't have to feel lonely, but particularly with the guys that you just mentioned, men that can actually stand in your fire and not hate you for it. Yes. That is very, very hard to come by. So when it comes to Andrew, Tristan, Sterling, you know, you have a four-time world kickboxing champion. Yes. You have the biggest playboy on the fucking planet, Tristan yeah. Tate, and you have a porn star. So that's what it took for me to find men that could actually be happy about me winning. Yeah. You know, without having some snide remark. And not only that, wanted to help win. And that's why I have such a such a large affinity for those men. I, I love them with all my heart. I yeah. hope that Andrew makes $4 billion tomorrow. Yeah. I don't give a fuck. I mean, like, like I don't, I don't hold any qualms about that. And so what the war room was for me was a place I could go and not have to apologize for trying to be great Yeah. or not have to try to apologize for the guy that was 1% better, you know, you know, to make him insecure about the situation. And, and so that's what I believe is so wonderful about the war room. That's what I believe is so wonderful about what we're doing at Hustlers University. We post receipts every day of guys that are winning. Yes. Good. Keep winning. Because really, I read this other day, um, it only takes about three men to take over a country. And in a lot of ways, that's true. Yeah. yeah. We, Raul we, Castro. Right. Uh, uh, what's his name? Che Guevara. And, and right. uh, what's his name? Uh, Fidel. Yeah. Three guys took over the country. In addition to that, it's so much easier. We have this joke. We say there's not another group of men that would tell a legitimate 10 out of 10 Instagram model with a blue check and a million followers to fuck off because your boy slept with her three years ago. Oh, boy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and that leads to my next point. It's really easy to trust men like that. Yeah. Because I don't want to be friends with a guy that is in lack of women or money. Mm, that's be hard. Because it's not a bad man that I'm worried about. Because a lot of times a bad man is too lazy to do anything. It's a desperate man. Mm. 
that I'm worried about because a desperate man will do very desperate things. Yes. And none of those men are desperate. Those men are in such abundance that they don't mind that the cowboy from Louisiana does very well wherever we go. They don't mind because they're in such abundance that who gives a shit? Right. You know? And so in regards to, to all of them, every, every one of them, including uh, Satorial, which is the other one we hang out, the Australian mm -hmm. one, who's, yeah. um, who's very, very high up in, in a company. Um, I love nothing more than to see them win. And I genuinely, all my heart, know that they love nothing more than to see me win. So we just do it together. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so, that's a no jealousy thing. Yeah. yeah there, and there doesn't need to be because there's no insecurity. Mm. It's the insecurity that pushes a man. It's an insecurity. And what happens is it's a lack of work leads to an insecurity and then to an anger and jealousy. It is really that part. The, the opposite of what you just said is all the people you have to leave behind. You don't right. think about, man, that you had such a great time with growing up back in Texas or Louisiana. And you just have to, you end up having to leave those, some of those people right. behind and it's really sad and you feel like a piece of shit and like, well, no, like you kind of understand you're not going to grasp some of the issues that I'm going through. It's like, oh, what happened to you? You know, it's like, oh, you've man, changed. You've changed, right? I fucking hope so. <laughs> Michael, when are you going to yeah. grow up and have kids? I'm like, grow up and have kids. What are you talking about? Like, that's, that's another I, one. I got to host the Maxim party this weekend. I'm sorry. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's another one. I think the number one thing that women and men use against a man is guilt. Mm. That's the number one thing that they use against men. It's like, oh, when are you going to grow up? When, when you gonna, motherfucker, when are you, when are you going to be able to like have your wife have to stop working, bitch? Like, when am I going to grow up? I employ over a hundred men. That you know how many how many people that is if you count their families and their children. Correct. Yeah. That's fucking responsibility. Don't tell me I'm not growing up because I like to bang uh, Instagram models. Fuck you. Yeah. So, and and I'm still responsible. I'm still kind. I had, a, I had a waiter spill something in my lap the other day. Dude, I got up and hugged them because they were so upset about yeah. it. And they thought I was going to be mad. And then I, I tipped them 150% on the bill. Yeah. I enjoy doing that shit. That makes me feel good. Yeah. I'm not a good guy. I do that for me just as much. You know what I'm saying? Like, but all the, the world has all these different things they use against men to make them feel bad or try to control them in all these different ways. And the war room is a great place to, to break that. Yeah, for sure. They do those things because they can't use muscle. Right? No, they can't use force. No. Right. Uh, I've talked to, uh, at length about TRT. Uh, this is something we talk about on the show because I've yeah. had a lot of gentlemen in here. Bradley right. uh, Bulzarian, Jay Cutler has been on here right. and he's talking about testosterone replacement therapy. And it's one of these things, regardless of if you guys want to do it or not, one of these things where I feel like if you go to a urologist or an endocrinologist, it's insane, dude. You'll have a 260 free testosterone, 260 uh, dec uh, uh, decaliters per. No, I'm sorry. Uh, picograms per deciliter and you'll go in there and they'll be like yeah you're fine and i'm like hey doc what if i want to fuck my wife like i'm not right. fine this is like there's an epidemic of 50 year old men committing suicide i'm not fine why are you letting me leave here with my test at 260 yeah. how is that okay how do you and i'm a 35 year old man how is that okay with you how is that not fucking negligence and then you go to a, a, um, a rejuvenation clinic and they're like, your test is below 300. They're like, oh, we're putting you on TRT. We don't need to do any right. more tests. We're, you're going to testosterone. And when I see that, I, I get to this point where I was like, I'm, look, I'm looking at the rest of the world. And then like you and me, let's say we're, we're in our mid fifties. Right. And we get on TRT. Uh, now we're wealthier and m maybe even better looking and in really good shape. And we have the mentality and the vitality of a 19 year old. Right. That's scary for the with rest wisdom. of the world with wisdom. That's scary for the rest of the world, Justin. That's why I think a lot of people like don't want to talk about, I love more plates, more dates. It's one of my favorite and Brandon Carter. He talks right. about this too. Um, is this idea that like us, I think TRT is something that's becoming very politically un incorrect. You're not, I, mean, I don't think you're old enough to like even be on it yet. But like at some point I'm, when I was turned 40, I was like, man, I don't feel the same anymore. And then when I get on this stuff, all of a sudden now I like just want to work on my business. I want to be in the gym, bench press max, squat max, like all right. this stuff happens. And I was like, man, I, I'm scary, bro. This is a scary, this is a scary thing. And I see this happen a lot. Um, but with going back to what you said before, she doesn't understand that I, you know, you may want to have sex with someone else and it has nothing to do with being in love. Part of the reason why is because your free testosterone may be 900 and hers is 40. Right. You're 17 times more right. testosterone than she does. I try to explain to my female friends, I'm like, you don't understand what it's, imagine yeah. the horniest you've ever been in your life, multiply it by 17 and now be six foot two and weigh 235 pounds. Yep. And then have an 18 to 80 blind, cripple and crazy. What do you say? 80 or 280? 80 or 280. 80 or 280. Like you just, dance. You, you don't understand what it's like. I, I always show them physically. Like yes. it comes, like, yeah. You know, you know yes. what I'm saying? It, of course. 
And, and, and they don't, they don't want to hear it. Yes, but it's true. It is true. It's absolutely true. I actually put hungry and horny in the same category. Like when I'm talking to a woman, I'm like, listen, to a man, hungry or horny, and let me, let me just put it to you like this. You, sweetheart, you're filet mignon. But as a man, if I've eaten filet mignon for five straight days, you'd be shocked at how easily I'll go down the scale and eat a corn dog. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. And <laughs> this is so true. It's Again, so fucking that, dude, true. Dr. Buss came on my podcast talking about like when men want short term uh, oh. dating strategies, like the, 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 the You'd step. Be shocked. I, I, we call it beer goggles, right? Yeah. He, he has, actually has a term for the study that he did. He's like, yes, uh, what happens is he calls it the closing time effect. Yes. It's like as you get closer to closing time, yeah. the standards like drop to embarrassing levels, right? Yeah. It's, it's really funny when he talks about that. Going back to what you said, also, uh, when men. Uh, they, they survey men who cheat and men who don't cheat. They survey women who cheat and women who don't cheat in a, in a marriage. Men who cheat and men who don't cheat, they report the same satisfaction in the marriage. When women cheat, yep. 80% of the time they reported lower satisfaction in the marriage. And that's coming from her lack of respect for the man. Yes. When men cheat, it is not to end <clears throat> the relationship. When Zero. women cheat, it is to end the relationship. It's a monkey branch to the next man. Correct. Which is why when I heard, you know, this is a very controversial statement, but from an, evol from an evolutionary standpoint, it does make sense, which was uh, Andrew talking about when men cheat is a bigger deal than when women cheat. He said that. He said that. They, he when, called, when women cheat, it's a bigger yeah, deal. When women, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. When women cheat, it is a bigger deal than when men cheat. Right. Specifically for that reason. When women cheat, it is to end the relationship. When men cheat, it's like we... Look, it's hard for women to understand. I can love my wife and kids and have sex with someone else, and it doesn't mean anything about my wife. It, it seems selfish, but it is unequivocally true. And I can show like limitless examples for the last 2,000 years of this actually being the case. And so, like what you said before, I, I thought it was interesting when he when Andrew brought that up. I was like, well, it is a bigger deal when women cheat because of absolutely. that reason. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And women don't don't believe it because they don't feel that way. Yes. Weak ass men don't want women to know it because in a lot of ways, that's their mating strategy. What they do, what a weak man does is he gives up sexual exclusivity for the woman. Mm. Whereas guys that are at a certain level do not have to do it, especially if they have the backbone and the balls to tell the truth. Mm, the truth. So there's nothing more than he wants or the church guy wants than for the woman to actually in her heart believe that I love the other woman because then I'm a bad man. Yeah. Now I'm a risk and she's not going to stay. So I think it's actually in a lot of ways the the reason there's so many males out there, especially like with these dating channels or or they're out, you know, they're they're trying to give this persona that men that sleep with other women are bad men. Those men are using that very thing as a as a strategy to get those women to come over to their side. I don't buy that shit at all. I if you if you lined up every man in the world and you put them in a closed room and you came in there with a with a button, a red button, and you mm -hmm. said, "Look, if you hit this button, you can sleep with as many women as you want, but you can go home, hold your wife, be a wonderful father, be loving, be a provider, be a protector with absolute love, and nobody's going to have a problem with it. Every man in the world would look left, look right, wait, make sure nobody's looking, and hit, hit that, that motherfucker with button. his elbow. Just Bam! Just, just pop off. off the top rope, yes. bro. And anybody that says otherwise is full of fucking it's, shit. It's so crazy when I say this to these to some females, and they're like, they think I'm lying. I'm like, no, yo, bro. My favorite, my favorite is this, bro. No, he would never cheat, and no, he doesn't have an Instagram because he's too busy with his job, honey. Yeah. He doesn't have an Instagram. Here, focus. Zoom in here, honey. He doesn't have an Instagram because he doesn't want you to know about his family. He doesn't want to know you to know about his kids. He doesn't want you to know that he's cheating on you. That's why he actually doesn't have an Instagram. I know it's hard. Some, some of you legitimately believe this nonsense. It's true. That's the reason why he doesn't have an Instagram. It's just so crazy right. to me whenever I see this shit. But no, you're exactly right. It's not, it's not about right or wrong. It's like just tell the truth. Yeah. And you said something else. You said the courage and the bravery to tell the truth. Not the courage and the bravery to sleep with other women. Right. You said the courage and the bravery to tell the truth. And that is the case. And it would be great you know, for women, the same thing, the courage and the bravery to tell the truth. Whenever I have women come to me or um, dudes come to me and they're like, I think my girl's cheating. I was like, she might not be cheating, but I bet you she's not interested in you anymore. anymore. Right. I bet you you've done something to make where you've taken advantage of the situation or you've neglected her or you've gotten to a situation where um, you're not validating her anymore. I bet you that's what's happening. She might be cheating on you. She might not be cheating on you. When women are like, I think my boyfriend's cheating on you, you're like, yeah. 
Yeah. That's what's happening. That is exactly. absolutely what's happening. Exactly. <laughs> and, and you know what? I, I had, I went on, I went on a podcast, Pearly Things, and I, and I talked to a girl. There's a girl that she like, she's like, I feel like it. And then she kind of admitted to it a few times. I'm like, why don't you just have the conversation with him? Because just like you just sent that message to, to the girl that is looking for his Instagram, mm. I would go as far to say to the woman that's married. He absolutely loves you. Yes. Him sleeping with another woman has nothing to do with the fact that he gets out of bed every morning, goes to work, fights dragons, and and goes through a large amounts of stress just to take care of you and that family that he loves. He loves you with all of his fucking heart. He just wants some pussy. And if you want to be a really good wife and secure in yourself, <laughs> then help him out because he ain't leaving you. Yeah. In fact, I think that if that was more prevalent, if women, if women could get that message, I think it would keep more marriages together. Because what I think happens is a man, he gets married, he trades off sexual exclusivity yeah. for that marriage, and then he starts to die inside. Because men invent, build, and maintain this entire world in that driving factor of women. Mm. And so what happens is he gets married, he gives up sexual exclusivity, and then he kind of dies inside because he can't go out and hunt anymore and he's just got to come to the same place and it gets boring and all these other things. There's no adventure, there's no life to it. And so at the end of the day, no matter how hard he works, it's the same result. So he, he, can't, he can't have any of those, those things that he used to when he was in college yes. or in the Air Force or playing football or whatever. The things that were exciting that, that really drove him to do better. And then what happens? He starts to get fat because there's no reason. Yeah. He starts to get lazy. He starts coming home and he's popping a beer open. And the next thing you know, she's tired of him. And then she cheats. So to me, I think honesty is the only way. Yeah. Like, hey, listen, this is how it's going to be. Boom, hold it with conviction. And just like any other time that you have to hold frame with your woman, you have to hold it with conviction. You don't have to be a dickhead. You can just say it respectfully, but directly. And more than likely, she's going to come around. Even if she leaves for a, for a week, she's coming back. If she really loves you, if she really loves you, yeah. she'll come back. Yeah, it, it, is, it, is, uh, it is difficult. But there is a difference. Like, it's not a good thing or a bad thing, right? You, you talked to her before yeah. about... So it's like this. Um, uh, I've mentioned this before on the, on the podcast. Ten percent of men get sixty percent of the right yeah. swipes on Tinder, mm -hmm. and forty three percent of uh, women get ten get sixty yeah. percent of the right swipes on Tinder. And uh, there's two philosophies here. One philosophy is fuck the society and fuck those men and fuck the women for choosing those men. Let's join an incel group. That's what incels for. Go join that. That's what they're for. And then the second one is let's become part of that ten percent. And that's what I believe. And it's hard because not everybody can join us. They can't, right? You no. talk about having individual problems. And so that part makes it very difficult. Um, I'm curious, in order to get into that top 10%, who are your mentors? And then you've also mentioned a group of uh, like some books that you like. Who are your mentors initially? And then what were some of, and it, you can even go back to construction. What were the mentors you found? And then what were some of the resources that you, you called on? Yeah, so in construction and business, I, I will start with, there was an organization I joined called the Metal Building Contractors Directors Association. Mm -hmm. I ended up being on the board for that at a very young age. And there's, there's guys that were almost like father figures to me when things would happen. Like, I'll never forget the first time I had one of my trucks stolen off a job site. Damn. Yeah. I, I can't even imagine that. I get a phone call. And like a rig like this, it's like a truck, rack, tools, boxes, yeah. ladders, the whole thing. So it's like 50 Gs. And, and um, I was actually doing some work for one of these big guys. And uh, so I was in, they were in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he called me. He's like, you all right? And he kind of said it with a smile on his face, yeah. a little, like I could hear the smile. And, um, and he told me about when he had had truck stolen. Yeah. There was a time, uh, another, another big mentor of mine named Gary Smith up uh, in Jersey has this company called Thomas Phoenix. And I kind of went to him one time and I was like, hey, uh, my, my accounts receivable is huge right now. I just don't see, I just don't see me making it. Yeah. He goes, Justin, if you don't have to go to the CPA once every few years and think we might go bankrupt, he's like, then you ain't doing nothing big enough to talk about, son. <laughs> and not, he laughed at me, slapped growing. me on the shoulder, and I'm like, you're not growing fast enough. I'm like, you know, I feel better for some reason. Yeah. Like that's not what I was looking for, but thank you. You know, so I, ha I had some really good guys in real life: Eric K. at Thomas, Thomas Phoenix, Sean Smith. I have to say their names out loud, man, because I, I love them. Mike Reynolds in Colorado. The, these guys meant the world. There's a guy named DJ down in Orlando, a South African guy, just hard fucking guy, man. Mm -hmm. And um, I really, 
it was almost like being raised with wolves in that way because I always could pick them up and call and it would never be, it would never be a, oh, it would be good. Okay, I had that happen to me 30 times. That means you're on the right track kind of type thing. In regards to books, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad on the way to pay Arkansas. So in Monroe, it's, it's a bus ride. So I read that and I knew I wanted to own a business. Uh, so I, I have to give that book credit. I know it's a very cliche thing to say, but really I think where I got my most was from a guy named Patrick Lencioni. He, uh, the ideal team player, getting naked. He talks about taking walls down, you know, and, and getting rid of politics in a business. So it's like all in the up and up. Um, death by meeting. Um, uh, he's got a whole series of books that I really, really feel like were very impactful to me. Of course, I read E-Myth, where, and that's where my systems and everything came together. And now we run EOS, mm. which is basically Patrick Lencioni and E-Myth put together. Yes. And um, it's, it's in a series by a guy named Gino Wickman. And so he, he has a book called Traction that talks about how to cyclically come back to problems and opportunities and, and check measurables, et cetera, to make sure that every position in the org board is performing. That metrics thing, bro, yeah. it, it's, uh, it's one of these things where I have like these fucking vicious salesmen that work yeah, for me, but yeah. they don't like get the metrics part. I'm like, yeah. hey, which one of the ads on which day got us the most leads? Right. And they're like, I don't know, fucking ads. Just right. let's, let's close these motherfuckers. And it's like, right. you don't understand, like, no, no, we got, because I was a military officer. I got to right. know how many pounds of fuel we're burning per hour. We're going to die. You know what I'm saying? So I, the metrics thing is definitely a, a, the big deal for me. The other thing is E-Myth Revisited, uh, the, the, uh, the technician, the entrepreneur, and the uh, manager. Like those things, yeah. were so such a big uh, eye-opening thing for me. It's one of the first things I make any of my clients read if they want to start their own business. Can you talk about that? Like how sometimes you'll do things. Like I know I'm a technician, right? I am, I I am a trader. I actually am a recruiter for like different like, venue like events. I, I'm on the microphone. I am a videographer. I used to work at the Playboy Mansion. Like all these things, I make. I put my hands on things and then I make things go places, right? right. Like airplanes, whatever. I know I'm a technician. I know that is what I'm good at. I'm a, you know, uh, so, so can you talk about having the three different types and how maybe you put yourself in the wrong type and you need to find people that are the other types? Yeah. So one thing that e talks about, and I, I very much believe particularly in construction as well is, is something called an entrepreneurial seizure. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. Let's say a guy's working for me. He's putting up buildings for me. He's like, I'm making Justin all this fucking money and I'm getting paid this blah, 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 blah. So he leaves and he goes out and it's just him and his little crew and they build a building and he makes some good money. And he goes and builds another building. He does it again. And all of a sudden, people start to hear about him. And he starts having to need more than one crew. And then he needs three crews. Well, the next thing you know, he can't be on job B mm. because he's on job A. And then job C is going on over here. Well, job B got, got put up wrong. And so now the roof's leaking. And because the roof's leaking, they won't pay him. And I was like, oh, shit, what do I do? So he goes over here, he tries to fix the leak, and he's starting to get burnt out. And then he goes over to building C, and he's got the same thing going on. Then he gets in a cash flow pinch. Next thing you know, bam, boom, he's out. What did he do? He's a technician he's trying a, to be an entrepreneur. And a manager. Okay. He just hired himself got it. to be an entrepreneur and a manager as a technician. Mm. So if I were a technician today, I would say, or if I was anybody today, I would say, okay, which of the three am I? And what do I need to hire to make sure that I don't find myself in an overwhelmed role as a technician or a manager or whatever. Right. You do the same thing. Let's say I was a project manager working for a company and I want to start a metal building company, but I had not been putting buildings up every day. I understood how to estimate, get everything right, win the contract, et cetera, but I myself couldn't put the building up. Don't you think I need a good technician and yeah, a of fucking course. good one? Yeah. You have to identify which one of those positions you are and then at a minimum hire somebody that can do those things. Yeah. The last thing you need in your business is somebody else like you. You need somebody to cover that base. Yeah. So in regards to E-Myth, it is that and the ability to create systems and checklists and accountability for each position. So in my company, we have five roles and responsibilities for each position. And each of those positions in the organizational board has a statistic that is tied to it. Wow. So okay. it's very, it, there's no ambiguity behind our politics behind whether that person's doing a good job or not. You are measured by this. We are going to look at it weekly together, all of us, and you are going to have to stand up and be responsible for that. Right. So there's no really, there's no really reason why you would need to fire somebody or not fire somebody based off of anything but numbers. Now there's, do they get it? Do they want it? type thing. Mm -hmm. And so intention is the number one core value in our company. Like fucks given is yeah. what it says, right? Not to be cute. Cause I know people like to use that word cutely, but it is yeah. intention. Yeah. I would much rather have a person with intent than talent. 
because if we're if we're running our systems correctly and they're checking the box, um, they can they can grow to get the competency. Yeah, you know. So for me, man, really understanding where you are in the org board and where you are in the picture between the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician is really important. And don't be scared to hire above yourself. Yeah. You no, know, no, I've definitely done that. Like with yeah. some salespeople that definitely knew more yeah. more stuff than me. Yeah. Um, did you ever like uh, I heard the vegetables and the dessert? Uh, it was a uh, what's his name? Alex Becker talked about selling them what they want versus what they need, right? And then yeah. uh, and then Ty Lopez talked about this, where he's like, I got this Lamborghini, and then check out these books. What you just talked about. Yeah. Is, there's probably some dudes watching this who tuned out. They're like, oh, he's just talking about this business stuff and hiring people. When, when they realize that they're here to try to like grow their network and meet women and all this kind of stuff, what you just talked about was probably more important, and yet it's hard for them to listen to it, right? Do you ever get frustrated with that? It's like, no, because I tell my guys, like I have, um, there's 114 modules in my program, and I, the guys all want, the, they want me to teach them the uh, social networking part, the social media part, and the event planning part. And then I'm like, you know the most important part for you guys to like meet women is actually the leadership section where I go over the lessons I learned in the US military. That's actually the most important part. And that's the one I look at the open rates. That's the one you guys watch the least. You just talked about how to run a seven figure business. And this is the, like, this is the part you guys should be taking notes on. And you're just waiting you know, for the next, the next quick sound bite about women. No, this is it. This is where the, this is what separates you from the, this is how you become that guy. Right, and, and, and that's the point. Let me tie it into women for you. Yeah. This is why it's so important that you do it. Because if you don't do it, you're gonna walk in the room hollow. There is a feeling and a vibe that comes off of an individual that has true confidence. Yeah. And so for you to be able to truly be that guy and make it easy for you to be confident, easy for you to speak with conviction, it's not easy for a man who has not accomplished to look at a woman and say, I'm gonna sleep with other women. Yeah. So what he does is he takes the other route. But if you become that guy, then it's so much easier to walk in a room and walk right up to a girl and tell her she's beautiful and introduce yourself mm. because you've done the work to know that you're the kind of man that deserves to see that kind of woman. Otherwise, it's going to be this hollow pit in your stomach where you know truly I don't deserve her, so I better go do some PUA so I can trick her. Yeah. Just become that guy and your life is substantially easier. And that's yeah. why I don't really fuck with PUA. I just simply tell him or any, anybody that contacts me, become a better man altogether and you won't need this game that you think because you will already be yeah you know do you, what remember, I'm do you remember when Derek Jeter was sleeping with Jessica Beale and Jessica Alba and Mariah Carey you remember that right you remember all the protesting people did yeah. no no one gave a fuck you nope. want to know why because he was worthy of that yep nobody had a problem with Derek Jeter right. sleeping with those beautiful women you want to know who else was sleeping with a bunch of women Tiger Woods Yep. And he was lying about it. He was lying to his fucking wife. And you see his wife over there crying because this motherfucker was a coward and he yep. lied. And what did, what did we do to him? We, they tore him in half. So here's the difference. We have one guy who just honest about it, never got married. He sleeps right. with whoever he wants. And no, they joke about George Clooney using like Jer Derek Jeter's penthouse to like yeah. bring women up there. That's how lascivious these people were. <clears throat> and nobody complained because these guys never lied about it. It's the deceit that bothers they, people. It was the deceit, and then they had a lifestyle that was congruent with them having that level of abundance. Right. And then Tiger, who also was congruent with having that level of abundance, he chose to lie about it. And now, because the people in golf, Disney, basically, actually Disney, is like, you need to have a wife, you need to have this clean cut image because you're a golfer, and then this is the way you need to do things. And if you don't do things this way, then you're not gonna be a successful golfer. So he listens to that, and he has his beautiful Norwegian wife, and then he cheats on her, and she's sitting there crying, and now we all hate Tiger. Right. That was it. One guy chose to lie, and one guy chose to tell the truth. That was you it. Know, and, and that's funny too, is the difference is this, is like we're mad at Tiger because he lied, mm. or we could look at him like we look at Derek Jeter and be like, "Fucking G." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't G. know about the Denny's waitress, but you're right. About but, the rest but, of it. But you understand yeah. what I'm saying? It's like because he owned it. Because of what he did, that nobody's mad, and it, it does show that truly deceit is what really, really hurts people. It's not people. the lying; it's the cheating, bro. Yeah, it's not the. I mean, it's, it's not the cheating; it's the lying. It's, it's the not lying. The cheating. And here's the thing, ladies, just so you understand: for you, the cheating is the lying. For us, the cheating is the penetration. You need to understand that is the difference. For us, it's like, oh, you you went and you saw your ex, and you guys went and had coffee. Did you do anything with? No, I don't give a fuck. Let's play PS Five. I don't give a shit. Uh, but if a woman is, you're like, oh, uh, you tell your girl, yeah, I saw my ex when I went back home to Monroe, and. Uh, we, we, went, we went and had dinner together and we talked about our feelings, and, but we didn't have sex. She'd be like, do you love her? Right. What, what's exactly. going on here? Exactly. Whereas for us, it's like, 
did you fuck the dude? No? Okay. Right. I'm, I was whatever. I don't care. It's hard for women to understand that because for women, the cheating is the line. For us, the cheating is the penetration. Literally the penetration. Like you can tell, you can tell us all kinds of stories. Did you have sex with him? That was the main thing because what did our ancestors do? If our, our ancestors who were not protective over the reproduction reproductive qualities of our mates, we were raising other people's children, period. There were, there were no paternity tests, right? Yep. And your genes were unapologetically weeded out of existence. So who was left? The man who was vigilant over his woman. Right. This is a hard thing for people to understand. Jealousy is not a naive, uh, what's it called? Immature adaptation for, for men. Jealousy is actually an evolutionary adaptation for men. And it's not like jealousy, like where you, you act overboard. Like I have a very simple rule. If you want to see other men, that's fine. You're just not my girlfriend. I'm right. not mad at you at all. You're just right. not my girlfriend. You can see right. other dudes. You're just not my girlfriend. Uh, you don't get to, you aren't the CEO of my company. You don't get to meet the boss at the hedge fund. You don't get to, you know what I'm saying? You're just not, right. you're just not my girlfriend. Um, and so, so that's the thing, like you just have to be able to set those boundaries and these are normal things that evolution has provided. It's not good or bad. Like you said before, it's not good or bad. Let's understand it. The problem is when you explain it to some red pill guys, they're like, do, do women like men who are taller? Yes. Well then fuck those women. No, 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 that's fine. They also like men who are in shape. They also like men who can, uh, acquire resources or have the potential. You ever see women, they go after uh, like young military officers or they go after young residents at a hospital who are gonna become full, full right. doctors. They date those men because they have the potential of gathering massive amounts of resources. And so we realize, we realize this, and it's, it's, it's unassailable. There's no study that will show you that that's not true. And it's the truth in every single society. Dr. David Buss did a study of 37 different cultures, found it to be exactly the same in every culture. So here's the thing. Do we hate women now because they want men with higher resources? No. We just need to get fucking higher resources. That's the answer. That's right. So well, that's my answer. That might not be your answer. Absolutely. Look, if I'm walking down a trail and I see a snake and I walk right up to that motherfucker yeah. and it bites me, am I really mad at the snake? <laughs> no. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, and, and, and that's what, uh, guys, they get mad at women. Women are one of the most beautiful, yes. amazing, wonderful parts of this existence yes. as a man. You simply have to do the work required for her to want to create that reality for mm. you. And if you've done that, you'll soon see that women are absolutely wonderful. They are. They're absolutely wonderful, especially when they love you and they can get behind you. You know, there's, there's not a more beautiful thing in this world than a woman that, that looks up to and values a man. Yeah. You know, it, it is what makes doing all this work worth it. You know, and that's why another thing on that subject, a lot of these guys don't believe in love. Right. You know, oh, I'm never going to. Dude, that's fucking bullshit, too. Yeah. You could absolutely love a woman. Yes. And and it be one of the most amazing things in your life. You can love a woman and know that love is also conditional. Those are two yeah. things that you both have to. But and it's factual. Pro, it's factual. Like un, unconditional love for a female homo sapien needs to be reserved for her children. Right. You, listen, man, if you guys have a kid, you want your if you're you want your wife to be willing to die for this kid. That's your kid. This yeah, is that's not, your legacy. That's your legacy. This is not some unfortunate turn of events. This right. is fucking human evolution. Yep. It has to be this way. Otherwise, there's not 8 billion people on this planet. Right. The species does not survive numerous near extinction events during the Pleistocene epoch if we do not have mothers willing to die for their fucking children. That right. is the reason why. So because she has reserved that unconditional love for her children and you don't get it, don't be mad about right. that. And it doesn't mean you can't love her. It right. does exactly right. And... and, and I say this often. I said, do get mad or play ball. Bro. These yeah. are the rules of the game. I didn't make them, but I am telling you because I care about you. Yeah. Disney and that fairy tale dream <laughs> that they've pitched you is a fucking lie. It's consumerism. And I think that a lot of the reason that a wedge is driven between men and women because you have ta twice the taxpayers. You know, you got all these bad bitches everywhere. Now they have jobs, you know. And I, with all my heart and not from an angry place, believe that women are less happy now than they've ever been. And I don't think it's going to get any better. When you say bad bitches, you mean girls calling themselves bad Girls bitches. that call themselves, I yeah, don't need no sure. man, blah, blah, sure. blah, blah, yeah, blah. I've seen that, yeah. You know, uh, and a lot of times girls will say that until the right man walks in their life and they'll change their whole fucking tune. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's very important for a young man, particularly a young man in my opinion, to understand that there's no reason to be angry, but there's certainly a reason to flip on the lights and look at it for what it actually is and always have that in your back pocket and understanding because it'll remind you when it's time to turn it on or not, you know, in, in your life. And especially with dealing with women or your career or whatever you need to do, or even looking in the mirror yourself, it's like, listen, I need to pick my shit up or eventually 
she's going to lose respect for me. Yeah. When she loses respect, she's going to leave. Yeah. So I, uh, it couldn't be more true. And unfortunately, guys don't want to face the truth. Let, let's talk about this. It, and it goes with dating and in your professional life. Unrealistic expectations pa- cause people to quit. I think that's the reason why people quit in relationships. And I think that's why people quit when you're talking about before about some uh, tradesman who runs off and starts his own business. He had unrealistic right. expectations. Can you talk about setting these realistic right. expectations so you don't quit? Right. So first of all, I believe that the, f- the formula to happiness is the gap between your expectation and your reality. Yeah. 100%. In, in regards to, to relationships, guys have this notion that because they chose this girl and they sent her flowers and they told her she was pretty and she looked good in that dress when she was actually a little bit fat, you know, and need to go to the gym. You, you understand? All these all these different... <laughs> and you expressed your feelings. Yeah. You told her your feelings. Yeah. She doesn't care about your All feelings. these different things and they think that she's going to be loyal because... Because he's not leaving and because they made a promise at an altar in front of a bunch of people somewhere in the South and in that it's always going to be a fairy tale. It's fucking bullshit. And what I think creates devastating pain to men. In fact, I believe that love has caused more pain than war. Sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's fucking close. Yeah. And so a man grows up. He, he, he does all the right things. He buys the flowers. He, he, he kisses her in the rain. He goes, to, he goes to work and then he comes home and expects her to love him even when he's fat and all these different things. And then she leaves and he gets a news flash from the world that everything he's been told was a fucking lie. And there's these actual rules about how the world really works and what female nature really is. And he fucking offs himself or becomes incelled or he hates women or, or lives in anger and pain for the rest of his life. It's one of the saddest things on the planet, all because he had the expectation that Disney was real and it's not. Yeah. It's absolutely not. And I'll tell you another thing, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but God's not coming to save you either. Right. I watched my father. My mother cheated on him with men from church. My father divorced her. She came back. He married again and then had to divorce her again for the same reason. And my father clung to the Bible. And he's a wonderful man. In the 80s, the information wasn't there. But God is not coming to save you. Your mother's not coming to save you. Your friends love you and want to see you do well, but they don't care enough to, to make you do something. The realities of this world are real. You have to go educate yourself on female nature. You have to do the work to become the kind of man that a woman wants. And then never forget what you know about how it works. And then that way you don't have to find yourself with this huge gap between your expectation yeah. and reality. Because if you do that and the gap is big, you're going to be fucking miserable at a minimum. Yeah. So, I mean, that is that is kind of a dangerous thing. And I have some friends because I do come from the Bible Belt also. Yeah. And I do have religious beliefs. Uh, but the thing is, like, where where was God with the Pol- Polish people when Hitler invaded in 1939? And then when the when the Hutus killed the Tutsis, a million people in 100 days in 1992 in Rwanda. Where was God then? Like, again, I'm not saying that there is no God. What I'm saying is it was a good idea for you to hide right. in them fucking bushes. It was a good idea right. for you to get out of. Uh, West uh, East Germany before right. before the fucking wall came up. It was a good idea for you to look after yourself and make sure that hey, I can help God help me out here right. and make sure that I do the best for myself and have a, a bunch of success. You know what's also great is not being uh, not having you know thirty uh, percent uh, body fat. Right. That, I understand God's supposed to save you, but you know what would also help is if you didn't have that high cholesterol. Right. It would help you if you you actually helped yourself in some of these situations because some people have these very unrealistic expectations and it becomes unhealthy when you think, man, listen. Uh, is God going to send you somebody? I don't know. What I do know is that God's going to send you somebody a lot better <laughs> looking. You know what I'm saying? When you when you do when you can speak better and look better and have a better job, that's just the way I look for it. Again, I, we talk about Bo Jackson versus Barry Sanders. Barry Sanders is going to duck and dive, and he's going to get right. to the end zone. He's going to make you miss. Bo Jackson does not care who's in front of him. Right. He is going to get to the end zone, and you're going to die trying to tackle him. That's the way I look at every single thing that we that we. It's not even a choice, bro. We have to do this. We have to. Here's another thing. I talked about this with Brandon Carter last week. He was on here. And, uh, and it was like, man, think about the, the opposite. What's the opposite, right? For, to not do what we say. Unlimited porn. Right. Right? I could call Postmates as much sugar, salt, and fat as my ancestors could ever dream of. I could kill myself on McDonald's French fries today. Yep. Just as, and it wouldn't even cost me $200. Yep. Just like the, the alternative to just sit there and have my mommy tell me I'm special. And like, I don't, yeah. that, oh, the, she broke up with you because she, she doesn't deserve you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? She's not good <laughs> enough for you. Yeah. Mom, really? She doesn't deserve me. She's at the Met Gala right now with Kanye. Yeah. I don't understand why she yeah. doesn't deserve me. That sounds a little weird. Um, and so you, you have all these things where you, you believe this, right? And then uh, you end up in the situation where like, you're, 
you, like you said, you, you believed in someone else's truth. You believed in someone else's truth that you were told and like you, you're gonna have to save yourself. If, that, if there's anything you take from this, and by the way, let's go back to this other thing. I love women, bro, I love women. I love being around women. I love yep. hanging out with women. I love talking to women. I, I, there's a woman, uh, uh, she's in her 60s and she taught me, she was getting 56% return at her hedge fund and she mentored me. I love that woman. Yep. I'll take that woman to dinner anytime she wants for her right. birthday. I, when, when my birthday party, I had four girls come and plan my whole thing and 56 girls showed up. Yep. I love the shit out of women. But the they're thing, wonderful. They're they love wonderful. you and respect you. For, it, that's exactly when they, when they love you and respect you. So I would like to pass that on as well is because a lot of people who are somewhat engaged in our circles, right. they get that wrong idea that this is the enemy. I don't, right. think, it, I don't think it's the offense versus defense. I really think that they are the referee in the, in the, in the field. Like yeah. We just have to play certain rules because Dr. Buss talks about this. Homo sapiens are the only species where men play on a battlefield dictated by the demands of women and women play on a d d battlefield that's dictated th by the demands of men. Meaning women dress and act a certain way because they're competing with each other for men and men do the same thing with the, with the paddock watch and the Lamborghini right. because women find that attractive. Those things are defined by like what women find attractive. We, we generally don't do a lot of things as far as status is a concern that women find unattractive, right? right. And so that's, that's a very interesting thing. I wanna, I wanna uh, transition to this where you talk about you would rather have somebody be, uh, be, be tough than be smart. Yeah. Right. And you, you, you mentioned this before. I love the story about you kept going to this site over and over again, yeah. giving your resume until this guy was like, I like that shit. Yeah. You yeah, talk yeah. about that? Yeah. So uh, I graduated college in 2009 and there were no jobs. Yeah. And so I had to take this job digging ditches in uh, a town a little north of Monroe, mm -hmm. or I can't, I don't know which direction, but it's in Bastrop, about an hour away. Bastrop is northwest of Monroe. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. And uh, I'd just broken up with Miss Louisiana, funny enough, because I didn't want to be monogamous. Yes. And I had my little heart broken because I thought I did the right thing, but I actually left a girl I love. So it was this like really tough time in my life. Um, and I ended up going back home after the job was over because I got laid off. So I'm back putting up metal buildings in the backyards and I'm waiting tables at night at Texas Day Brazil mm. in Baton Rouge. And um, I would go take a resume, which basically had fucking nothing on it, right? right? It had nothing on it. And they were building a hospital and it was a huge project and there was these job trailers out there and I would go into the job trailer and there was a gatekeeper. I'm like, excuse me, man, you know, 24, 23, 24. I'm like, excuse me, man, can I see the boss? No. Three, four days later, excuse, hey, is he available today? No, I, you, you know, you know, I can't let you talk to him, blah, blah, blah. So but about the fourth or fifth time I went in there, um, I started talking to her. Like I started to kind of build a rapport with her, you know, the gatekeeper. And she goes, you know what? Hold on. So I sit down and this grizzled, just angry ass looking 50 something year old white man comes in. He goes, are you Justin? I'm like, yes, sir. He goes, come with me. And we go back to the back office and he plops down in the seat and I sit in the chair. I'm kind of on the front of the seat. Right. And he goes, and so I'm all like, and I slide it to him. He looks at it, he looks at me, he looks at it, he throws it on the desk. He goes, you mean to tell me you've come into this $40 million project? And I know you've been in here more than once because yeah. I've heard about this shit. Yeah. Four and five times to interrupt me while I'm trying to build this fucking hospital and just so you can get a job? And I'm like, yes, sir. And he leans back in his chair and he goes, I like that shit. <laughs> Gave me a fucking job. There you go. And, and it's cool, too, because I took the money I made from that job and auto directed it into another bank account because I was getting I was getting paid really well. Yeah, um, for my age, into another bank account and applied for my contractor's license because you had to have a net worth of ten thousand dollars and nobody you could have put me and my whole family together wasn't there, and that's how I made the money to apply for my license to start my business and that was about twelve years ago. That's crazy, man. So yeah, it was wild. And it was two different uh, commercial license you were trying to get for two. Yeah, different. so yeah, so I I put the money in one account. And um, I wanted to apply for the commercial license as well. So I like move bank accounts or whatever. I might not even have needed to do that, but I, I played the move. Yeah. Uh, and so I applied for both. So I do have a residential license as well. I don't use it. We only do commercial, but it was, it was definitely, it was definitely a part of it, man. And I don't feel like I would be as happy with where I am without that story of struggle. Yes. Which is something that I really, really, really want to emphasize to guys because man, if you were born rich, that's like being born in captivity at the zoo and you're a lion. And then they close the zoo and you don't know how to fucking hunt. Right. It's not fulfilling. It, it, like, I, I can't say that I miss when times were really hard and it was stressful. 
But man, there's nothing like not having a safety net. Right. There's nothing like feeling like you're on a journey and you're the hero in your own show and, and you have this great opportunity to do these very big and bold things like piss somebody off that badly and it just might fucking work because you're crazy because people can respect it. And you'll need those stories later to be of any kind of substance in life in a room. You know, so yeah, I'm definitely I'm definitely proud of of my doing that. And I, I also live my life in that way. Yeah. I, I generally make decisions like that based off what I call the rocking chair test. And so when I'm 90 years old yeah, and I'm sitting in my rocking chair and I'm looking back at my life, did I take risks? Am I proud of that 35 year old man and what he risked and how hard he pushed? And, and so I actually have this thing in my phone. I don't think anybody knows this. I don't think I've ever said this out loud. Um, I have this album in my phone where I talk to him and I tell him where I'm at and I'm wow. telling him what I'm thinking about. You tell you you're old, they get yes. in a rocking chair. That's yeah. incredible, man. Yeah. And so I'm always going to have it. So I'll be able to go back and look over the years, you know, Hey, today we're at this, I'm dealing with this, this is how I feel about it. You know, I'm going to do this today. I'm nervous about it, but you know, I'm going to do that's this, a, this. That's just like writing down your goals. I think yeah. it's the same part of your brain that you're yeah. using. Yeah. Yeah, probably so. And, and I talk to him mm. and my main goal in life is to make him proud of me. No one else. That's incredible. Because if he's proud of me, then I will have loved myself. Not living in a life that made other people proud of me because fuck what they want. Listen, man, I'm surrounded by so many crazy ass Instagram models. I don't know if I'm going to make it to that rocking chair. I got to be honest with you, but yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to burn bright while I'm here. Yeah. yeah for so, sure. so I mean, whether it's, whether it's 90 or 60 or whatever yeah. it is, man, I just want to be proud of that, that young man. Yeah. So, uh, that's kind of, that's kind of one thing I do to, to, to keep my perspective in check, especially when there's fear around. So gratitude, right? So let's just say a guy is born with money, right? I try to put in perspective what, would, what it would have been like to, to be born before 1850 and half the people, half the population died before the age of five mm -hmm. or born before 1943 or 1930 when we didn't even have antibiotics, right? And like you, you would catch tuberculosis, goodbye, you're dead, right? There's no, there was no cure for it. Or to live in China during the, uh, during the uh, was it, they had a wheat starvation or whatever, a drought where 100 million people died. Or 60 million people died from the Spanish flu. Or all these other things, the, the bubonic plague that happened, that's like 60% of the world's population ends up dying of plague. And the whole, the whole, all of Europe is infested with rats. All these situations, you got problems. You don't have problems that bad. Trust me, the people got way bigger problems than you just because you had to pay $290 instead of $260 to fly on Southwest to go to Miami. Right. That's not a problem. They, right. There are serious problems that people have. And like you said before, I, I've said this before, it's, it's interesting. I actually thought about Roland Tomasi when I, when I made this, when I made the statement. The further away we get from the survival scenario, the closer we get to woke. The yeah. closer we get to the survival scenario, the further away we get from woke. It's, and I'm not even, it's not even a testament against woke. But woke behavior comes from a distance from the survival uh, scenario, meaning like the zombies have come back. What are we going to do? Well, it's going to be big, strong, violent men who are going to protect us. And that's essentially what's going to happen. It's not a good or bad thing. This is just the reality of, of the world that we live in. Um, let me talk. I, go ahead. I completely agree with that. Yeah. And, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but um, in regards to the kid that, grew, that is born rich, mm -hmm. that doesn't stop you from being able to go build up your body, go throw a punch and take a punch, uh, be able to acquire a skill set and just have the brutal conviction and, and confidence in yourself through building all those other things to say, hey, I was really, really lucky to be born into a certain family. Yeah. But I did go build up a competency. I built my body. I built who I am as a man. I have a very kind heart. I'm very educated and I didn't squander it. That alone should be enough for an individual that was born with money to feel like they have created a scenario where they are the kind of man they want to be. Because I believe there's something called buckets. I call it buckets. So I always say I would never trade places with Mark Zuckerberg. Mm. And the reason is at a certain amount of money, that bucket starts to overflow. At a certain amount of fitness, you can be as fit as you want. You can be fucking 6'3", jacked yeah. as fuck, but you can be broke and dumb as a box of fucking rocks. So you have to fill all these individual buckets and if you're born with money, okay, fine, that's filled. But it doesn't exonerate you from going how to learn how to box or get in good shape or be well-spoken or be well-read and all the other things that complete a man as a whole. It's just one fucking bucket. So, uh, I, I would want to be Mark Zuckerberg because, like we talk about with Madden, 
Like, I don't think all of his shit is up to 99. I think That's he's got, the point. I think he's got a couple of things. That those money. are my buckets. He's got money up to 99. Yeah. I think he has intelligence up to 99, but it's like. But that's it's, it. It's like, like, I would rather be Lawrence Taylor or, or Michael Parsons. I want to be fast and strong. Right. Right. I want to be smart. Like, I want all those things up to 99. Right. So right. it's one of these situations where, like, uh, you know, I, I tell my guys this all the time. It's like, you, you made a great video about clean your room. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, clean yourself. Yeah, man, you have no idea, man. That, that you have this guy, and it's like 80, 90, 90. I, and I go through, I, I like look at this is your Instagram 95. Like, we'll give a score, right? And then we get to like your breath smells, bro. Your breath right. smells 50, 45. Right. Like, why, how am I supposed to go forward with the 45? You clean your room. I see dudes, and their room is a disaster. Like, why is there an empty fucking bowl of Chipotle next right. to your bed. You, the reason why you aren't bringing women home is because right. subconsciously you know you can't bring anyone back to this shit. Right. That's the reason why I fix this shit, man. Yep. And it's crazy when you say that to them. And when the ones who love it, they stick with it. They come into right. the program, they change their life. The ones who don't like it, they go off and do other things, right? I mean, they, they, you know, they complain or become incels or whatever and that 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 you know that's the issue man it's it's a it's a function of growth and being able to take criticism right i'm sure when right. you first joined war room they probably told you things or when you met andrew he probably told you things hey man i don't you, you should change this or if andrew's should. my friend and i fuck up today he's gonna tell me he's gonna tell you you know what i'm saying exactly and, and vice versa in any scenario and if, and if i can't if i can't tell him or he can't tell me are we really friends right we're not yeah we're not we're we're we're, we're larping as friends Really? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. That's hilarious. You know, uh, Andrew has a question for you. And his question is, what is your favorite song? Oh, OK. <laughs> well, he knows very well that my, my favorite song is still Make Cheyenne by George Strait. OK. And um, the reason it's my favorite song is because if you listen to it and you really understand the words and the meaning behind it, that um, it's a really, really beautiful thing, especially in regards to manhood. So you have a man who's trying to make the rodeo and he's trying to do everything he can in his life and he's on the road and he's doing his best and uh, he, he doesn't make it. He doesn't make the short go again. He's coming home. He calls, he calls his girl and uh, he's, you know, I didn't make the short go again and I'm coming home. I know I've been away too long and sorry I didn't get a chance to write a call. I know this rodeo has been hard on us all where she tells him not to come home. There's somebody new and instead of simping, Instead of trying to talk her out of it, he's on his mission. He's on his path. Mm. And so the next lines of the song is he leaves the phone dangling off the hook. He slowly turns around and give it one last look. And then he just walks away. And every man has his own rodeo. Every man is out there trying to catch his journey and hit it at 100,000 miles an hour. And at that point in your life, especially on the upward trajectory when you're younger, you're going to lose people, you're going to lose women, you're going to lose family members, and people are not going to understand you and your path. And the reason I love that song so much is because he took that scenario and in strength, he walked away and he pointed his truck towards that Wildman line. And what else can you do as a man but saddle up and catch the next rodeo? And I think that song is a very, very good representation of what manhood actually is because every man has a rodeo. Every man is going to be kicked off the fucking bull. Mm. Every man is going to have a woman try to walk away. And if you don't leave the phone dangling off the hook and go win the next rodeo, how are you going to become the man that she wants to call back or you just simply replace her? And I've noticed on my path in my own particular rodeo, any ex I've ever had has called me back. Yeah. And that's not something I say because I'm making fun of that particular individual. But that girl, the Miss Louisiana, that I would see three billboards on the way to work. Yeah. She called back. Yeah, they call back. That you haul, sure. cowboy. That is so, for sure. Um, when you don't call, they call back. You know, uh, for me, it was um, I was stationed at Al Udeed Air Base. Uh, in 2006 and the girl that I was seeing my father had just passed away like six weeks prior and it was too much for her man she had this dating this guy dad just died then he gets deployed and a couple weeks later she writes me a message you know dear John letter or whatever and then I see then this is you know my space started in 05 uh, yeah. so, and I'm watching pictures of this girl in Cabo San Lucas with this fucking dude this roided up marine and I'm just like and I gotta watch that and I, I just remember that's when I 
first started reading the power of now then eventually you know the new earth and i got into all these self-help books how to win friends and influence people uh rich at not rich at poor um uh think and grow rich all these things then eventually the subtle art of not giving a fuck and then the one thing by gary keller and then the e-myth and then all this stuff and he just like triple speed audio books and i started going through that and that was kind of one of the things that triggered it was just like yeah, the world's just going to go on without me. I didn't even hate her. And yes, she called back. She came to visit yeah. me in Vegas, 100%. But like that was that was definitely a, war, uh, a tough thing. And there is a trigger. There's a low point for everybody. And I look back now, I'm grateful for it. Man, cool. You know what would have happened instead? I would have married that girl. Bro, you want to talk about thing. a fucking disaster. Same I would have married that girl. That, that Marine Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. saved your life, bro. <laughs> yes, sir. You saved Simplify. your life. Yes, sir. You saved your life, That's bro. correct. That's correct. Um, yeah, man, that is, that part is is very crazy. So uh, let's talk about this, man, because I don't I've never heard anybody ask you this question before. You were on that 07 team, uh, so let's talk about you. High school football, you were a really good tight end in high school. Uh, what you went to high school in Monroe, and then you went to UL Monroe. I, I went to Denham Springs High School. I was born in Monroe. Okay, and um, actually, it's a very interesting story. We had a horrible football team. Okay, we were not very good. I had no recruiting going on. I took a visit or two. Uh, ended up getting called. They asked me to walk on. I earned that scholarship. Yeah, on the field, I earned it because I, I started playing. You know, so after the after my redshirt freshman year, they like I was playing, and the other dudes had scholarships sitting on the sidelines. So they gave me a scholarship. Yeah. So um, that's what happened there. I um, I wasn't very highly recruited at all. In fact, my senior year, I played tackle. We sucked. I was like really? one of the I was one of the biggest dudes, and I played tight end. I started as a sophomore on varsity at tight yeah. end, and then played my junior year. And then the team, because we sucked, we tried to switch the offense to like this spread. Yeah. And they put me at tackle. Yeah, because they don't have any tight ends. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's what happened. And um, I went to Monroe and I earned that scholarship and they paid for the school. It cost me a shoulder, but it is what it is. Right. So. Right. And then the, can you talk about the just, I mean, for, for somebody from a leadership standpoint or from a teamwork standpoint, you guys you keep Alabama in the second half. It's 14 yeah. 14. You guys score a touchdown and then yeah. they go for, they go for on fourth down twice. And they don't yeah. end up getting it. What I mean, when you watch the the TV, it's just nothing but Nick Saban looking like he, somebody just yeah. shitting his Cheerios. Yeah. But I'm just thinking about what what are the guys from what are the Warhawks thinking at this point? What was what is going on before that game, during that game, and after that game when you guys beat Alabama? Cool. So, you know, it's a money game. Yeah. So they, I think they wrote us a check for seven eight hundred grand. Yeah. To come come play them that day. Um, we took a bus ride because it was close enough, low budget team. We did fly planes when we went to play like Florida Atlantic and shit like that. But we took a bus ride. We get there. One thing that people don't talk about um, about Brian Denny Stadium is that on the visitor side, it's not a statue of Nick Saban or Bear Bryant's graveyard, which is very interesting. Um, uh, college football is very interesting in the, in the way of like how fans get so excited. They throw beer bottles at the bus, whatever. And it's always exciting because, you know, you're you're 18 to 20 years old. You got your jumpsuit on. At that time, you're like, you're listening to like Eminem. You know, like you think, you know, it's really cool. And you go on the field and you look up and then and then it's time to put the fucking pads on. And one thing that I, I say or that drove me to start talking to people about saying nobody's coming to save you is warm ups are very fun. Yeah catching the ball, you got your chin straps undone, you know, you might have the, bro. you know what I'm talking about. Like yeah, warm-ups warm are fun, but I'm like one-handed warm-ups. Yeah, you like get lit catching up. balls and shit like that. And But when you walk on that field and it's like kickoff return and you're counting and you're like, one, two, three, four, five, fuck. And that dude's like six, four, dreadlocks, 245, jacked, and he's just jumping, like swinging his dreadlocks, and you know he's about to come 60 yards, and you're going to have a crash course and, in and life. He, and he runs a 4-3, and yeah. he's going to get picked in and, the first round? Well, no. It, no, here's – no, it makes it – it's even worse. He's actually a five-star sophomore that would start at any other team in the country. Yeah, but he's playing special teams at Alabama. But he's playing special teams at Alabama, and he's got two or three plays yeah. in the game, and he's about to try to fuck you up, G. And so you're counting, and you're like – all right, let's get it, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's, it's a very real thing. And I played before they changed the kickoff rule. Boy, yeah. I was in the wedge. Yeah, so, so for people who don't know, there used to be this thing where you'd have guys would make a wedge and, and they would 
run. The, the wedge actually wasn't the problem. It was the guy on the return team or on the, uh, on the, kickoff. On the kickoff team who actually had to break the wedge. And you, yeah. we had guys having horrible fucking injuries right. because it's basically you get just, your neck broke. It's a bowling ball. Like you're running into this fucking right. offensive center who's, got, who's holding hands with four yep. other dudes, and they're just ramming into you. Right. Your job was to break the wedge. And I've seen guys get just destroyed. Knocked from doing the fuck out. So they yeah. got rid of that rule because, guys, listen, if, if I hit you and I'm holding on to two other dudes, I'm essentially 600 pounds. And right. I'm like, like people are getting destroyed. Right. So they changed the rules, and then they moved the kickoff for, up further so that right. less people there's, would Yeah, there's get more injured. touchbacks. Yes. But but just in general, so we go we go into the stadium or whatever, do the warm ups, all that good stuff, and then you go to walk out at Brian Denny, mm -hmm. and it's a hundred thousand strong, and the frat boys are twenty feet above you throwing beer on you, you know, telling you they're gonna fuck it's shit they would never say to you in real life, mm -hmm. right? And and you go in, and you know, kick off, and and it was it was interesting. We we really just executed. Yeah, they turned the ball over four times. Yes. And this is really important in business. It's if you could call it lucky, and I believe that if we played them a hundred more, they'd have beat us every fucking time. They had DJ Hall, they had John Parker Wilson. They had uh, the the guy that lined up against me was a guy named Wallace Gilberry. That dude played for the Chiefs like forever. Right. I don't. He might still be playing for yeah. all I fucking know. I mean, just absolute animals. And on top of that. They can take out that whole starting lineup and bring and, in five and, stars and bring five stars in just like, and they'll wear you down that way. What we did is we really stuck to our fundamentals. We played the game that we knew we were supposed to play. They made mistakes. We capitalized on the mistakes and we stayed in that game long enough for the belief to start to change. And I think that's important in business. I think that's important in fitness. I think that's important in any part of your life. And so the, the closer it got, to the fourth quarter being over, I believe the more we thought we could win the game. Yeah. And I've watched the film, because we would always watch the film on Monday, but I've actually watched it again since. I remember we're sitting in what they call victory, where it's like, so I was on one side of the quarterback, mm -hmm. and the other guy was on the screen. He's just taking Are you the hit. backfield? I was in the backfield. Okay. Yeah, so it. I'm sitting in like, a like you know, at a 45, two-point stance. Mm -hmm. Like, we're just kneeling on the ball, running yeah. the clock out. And I just snapped my helmet and just kind of, I could not... At that point, everybody's jumping around. They, their players are not coming to shake hands with us. So they're going straight to the locker room. Our guys are doing – we're in the locker room doing, like, fucking snow angels at a Gatorade. By the way, Alabama's visiting locker room. Yeah. It was probably ten times nicer than our home life. <laughs> Alabama carpets, <laughs> flat screens. I mean, just, like, nice showers and shit. Like, it was bad boy. Like, we, I love yeah. those big games, like yeah. playing Clemson and shit like that. Yeah. Like, it was really cool to, to do all that. They had a media room in there, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Our whole fucking stadium didn't have some of the shit that they had in the visitor's locker room. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you, one of the coolest things about that day for me is when we got to the Louisiana state line. We were coming on the bus. Oh, wow. 30 state troopers with the lights on waiting for us. 15 in front, 15 in back. Must have went 100 all the way home. We get there. It's like 2 in the morning. The band's there. The news is there. Everybody's there uh, because we killed a giant that day. Yeah. And I think everybody, like I said, everybody's got a rodeo, and everybody can kill a giant if they're persistent. He's yeah. going to slip. And so if you capitalize on it, then uh, it could change your life. And I'll, I'll never forget that day. In fact, that day particularly is, is probably the, one of the very few things I talk about in sports because I was lucky enough to realize that it, like, it was a very transactional decision for me in high school to quit playing baseball and basketball and play football. Yeah. That it was going to pay for my school and that was going to be because at that time I thought that college was the best thing for me to do. And it was. It got me out of my town. But the lessons that football gave me are far, far more than what I learned in the classroom. And I think that doing things like beating Nick Saban in Alabama and a bunch of players that I was very used to seeing on SportsCenter was very good for me in the way mm -hmm. of walking in a room and meeting someone that was supposed to have some certain level of clout and not looking down on them, but being comfortable in my own skin. So for that, I have um, college football to think in a lot of ways. Do you, do you ever have this issue? I, I, I ask a lot of guys in the self-help community in general, I get to speak at a lot of different yeah. things. I'm like, how many of you guys play team sports? And bro, it is shockingly low. Well, it's not shockingly low. It's like what you'd expect. It's just like so many times when I try to make these analogies, they talk shit and we score 63. Yeah. Or like there's these stories and like people think, no, these are, here, here's what I think happens. You grow up awkward. 
you, you're just a weird dude, whatever, for whatever reason, you, girls don't like you, you grow up awkward, and then you end up later on in life being awkward. When you're in high school, who are the guys who picked on you? They were the jocks, they were the guys who were yeah. very popular. And then you look on TV and you see these guys playing football, you see good looking guys like Tom Brady or, mm -hmm. or really muscular guys that are popular, women go after them. And you're like, I don't like those guys. And, right. I, and one of the guys, things I tell my guys is, well, listen, the, the clients in my program, you need, to be, you need to be friends with these successful people. And a lot of them are gonna look like that guy who put your head in the fucking toilet when you right. were in high school. And this is hard for you to want to be friends with that guy. Does that right. make sense? And so you completely, you never played basketball, you never played football. I make all my clients play basketball, by the way. We, we go, really? we go hoop. yeah. Because they don't have to like be good at it, but just like, let's learn spacing. I want you to look like you're competent. Let's right. learn to talk to one another right. in a three dimensional area. You know what I'm saying? Let's learn to be a little bit competitive and how to follow rules and stuff like that. And, um, and it's just one of these situations where when they didn't play any of it, if they were not in the military, they didn't play basketball, football, baseball, they didn't play soccer, they didn't play any team sport. And by the way, I'm fine if it's boxing too, because you still have a trainer and you have sparring right. partners and stuff like that, or jujitsu. When they didn't do any of those things, there's these little pieces of, again, Barry Sanders versus Bo Jackson. There's these little pieces that they just don't quite get, right? Does that make right. sense? And it hurts them. It, because, it, but it, it's hard to get that dog in them. There's the dog. Right. It, I can't get the dog in them because they never they never played against a team that was way better than them and just being like, I'm not letting, I don't give a fuck what happens. Right. This guy's not kicking my right. ass. You think you're going to dunk on me. Guess what is going to happen? You're going to end up right. in the fucking hospital. I'm not right. saying you can't dunk. Right. You ain't going to dunk on me. And if you do dunk on me, you're going to fucking earn it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? saying? That's what I'm saying. Like so, that, yeah. That, that's, but they never had that. And, right. and the thing is, like, because they were taught to follow the rules and because Disney taught, taught them to follow the rules, they end up in the situation where, like, they never, they still think someone's going to come save them. They still think that they're special. Guys, you're not special, man. I'm not saying that right. to insult you. You're just not. You're just a dude. Nobody, like, goes on your Instagram to, like, look at photos of you and masturbate. Like, they don't give right. a fuck. They do it for women. They don't right. do it for you. They don't give a right. fuck, dude. And so when you come to that realization, then it just makes things a lot more, a lot, a lot easier. Um, let, let's, let's talk about this real quick. So back to your business, when we talked about your business yeah. before, you said that you had a conversation with your father where he was worried that you were growing too fast. Yeah. I had Nick Cosman on here and he said the one thing that he regrets the most was that when something worked, he didn't 10 exit, right? We had Ty Lopez on and Ty Lopez talked about when he, when he found that one video that was working for him, he put over $20 million dollars. I think it was 20, it may have been $16 million, something yeah. like that, in the, hey, here we are in my garage, this is my Lamborghini. He put so many millions of dollars in that to it got 91 million views. It actually got more than that, it got like 300 million views. And then, and then he, was, he, was doing, he was doing 60 grand an hour, like when, when he first started with that program. You talk about, well, now you got something that works, and now we need right. to 10X that, like Grant Cardone says, we need to 10X that thing. Can you talk right. about, no, you, you can't grow too fast, you need to grow fast or else you're dying. Right, absolutely. So a lot of people, I feel like they try, they try to make a business sit still. A business is either growing or dying, period. And so that's why I think it's very important to understand and, and utilize systems. So as the sales go up, you can actually fulfill what you're, what you're committing to. So yeah, absolutely. I 100% stand by that. It, if you're not growing, you're dying. You should be growing at all times because if you are not growing, you are going backwards. Because it, business, it's almost like a wave effect. You yeah. know, like you, you turn out a certain amount and, and a wave kind of come, comes with it. And if you think you're going to stop and hit the brakes on that, you're absolutely wrong. You're just going to get boiled over. Do you ever have to give this speech to people that work with you? Because like, you, you talked about having different components. For me, right. I thought the, the leads component was going to be the first thing to dry up. It wasn't. We didn't have enough salespeople. That was my yeah. problem. You talked before about I can't find good tradespeople, right? You're like, right. you would rather have a, a good plumber and a carpenter than a guy with a college degree at this point. Right, absolutely. Yeah, so can you talk about that? Like, you need to explain to some of these people, like, we have to keep growing. Because I'm sure you have probably people who are very comfortable being in a union, and they're not, they're like, they, we don't want to grow. We're like, we're good where we are. And they're not comfortable with you taking chances. Do you ever have these conversations with people you work with? Yeah, we're private. I, I think um, the, guy, the guys in the field uh, normally mm -hmm. are more short-term thinkers. Yeah. I spent a very long time. I, this is a punch I took multiple times, actually. I, I would, I don't know, listen to a Simon Sinek video or yes. some shit like that. Yeah. And think that I was going to be the Google of metal buildings, right? So I'd sit my guys and I'm like, guys, do y'all want to, let's do this thing where we like help you. And they're like, fuck that. Give me a $2 an hour raise. Yeah. So I had so with my guys in the field, it's more we are very good to them around their birthdays. 
Mm-hmm. We, we send their wives to get their nails done. We like show them a lot of love. And then we put short term goals. Like if y'all finish this roof by said time, paying all you guys an extra G mm. that kind of stuff yeah. in the office. One thing that I'm always pushing is that we had better be recruiting just as much as we are trying to sell yes. to fulfill it. And we, and we have an internal formula that we know if I, I know that if I hire, let's say 10 men, that probably half of those men are going to be worth their salt. And then maybe some portion of those men are going to get offered another job or they they might be in a bad place in their life and they'll, they'll be good in two years, but right now they're not good. So there's, there's the, the controls of paying attention to all the cogs in the office and the, and the saying that, Hey, I'm excited that you sold another million dollars worth of work. Let's make sure that this person in recruiting is matching that performance so we don't find ourselves losing money on this million dollars worth of work. And so for me, when I'm having to push them, because we're always pushing revenue. Yeah. It's, it's, it's non-negotiable. Yeah, for sure. It's non-negotiable. It's the supporting to make sure we hit the margin. That is something that I find myself pushing for most often because of all of the things that it actually takes in my business for somebody not to die, for the building to go up correctly and for us to hit the schedule and be able to show up and turn up for the people we make our commitments to. So those are the things that I think I push the most in the business. You talk, uh, Roland Tomasi asked you about a labor shortage, right? Yeah. You find, do you find that it is hard to find? Cause I'm, it's not the same thing. Obviously we're doing tech sales, right? We're right. selling a, yeah. uh, 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 how do you determine, you mentioned before about your give a fuck factor. Right. H- how do you determine who you're hiring? What this seems to be like, the most important thing is figuring out whether or not you hired the right person. I won't go into great detail because I do feel like that's my secret. You got it. Uh, In regards to like, if anybody were to watch this, that's in competition. For sure. But I'll tell you, there are five things I check for. Mm. Proven competence. Humble, hungry, smart, which is from a Patrick Lencioni book. Mm -hmm. And luck. So I'll go through them. We can ask a certain question. And if you know, if you know your shit, and I wrote these questions, Mm -hmm. If you know your shit about these buildings and you've been doing this work, you can't lie about it. Because normally a guy will say, oh, I've been doing it for this long, but he can't prove it. Yeah. And he, and he can't do certain things to prove it. The questions are written around. There's no way he would see these questions coming. And if he answers them any way but these ways, I know he's lying. Got it. Right? Humble. Are you willing to work under another man or to do our systems for a little while until you learn how we do it? Um, hungry. Are you cool with working weekends? You know, will you go out of town, right? Uh, smart. Tell me, to, like, what has you looking for work? We, we write questions that we purposely try to get him to talk shit about his current employer. Yeah. Because if he'll talk shit about him, he'll talk shit about us. That is true. And he's going to be cancer. And so these things are reducing from five, from five guys that work out of 10 or three guys that work out of 10 now to seven, not to eight, a nine. And then, uh, pro- and then look. I don't want a person that has bad luck in my company. Interesting. Yes, because I feel like in a, in a big way, you create your own luck. Wow. And perception of how you look at it. So if, if I can draw from you that you do not have quality luck in your life, then I don't want you working with me. Yeah, the guy keeps tearing his ACL right. or the girl who or, keeps getting in yeah, car accidents. Or whatever or, it is, yeah. you, you bring that in. And so because we interview so many people and talk to so many people, I use what's called the Fibonacci series under every question. Yeah. So they say that it's very hard for a human to tell the difference between three and four and four and five. So in Fibonacci, we use one, five, nine, 13. Yeah. And I'll give you an example of how she would use this so I could go back and look at it. Hey, are you willing to work on the weekends? Yeah. I'm, if you really need me, you know, I'll do that for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, are you willing to work on the weekends? Absolutely. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I, yeah. I, I'll definitely work weekends. Been doing it my whole life. I love it. Yeah. I love what I do. 13. Oh, you score them using score, Fibonacci numbers and then you use that as a total. Because I can't pull the flexion in their voice. I think I'm going to do that for my bikini competition. I was using Fibonacci numbers. That's a, that's right. genius because they're so different from yes, each other. They're different. Got it. Okay. So you can so what she's trying to do is she's trying to pull the flexion yeah. in the yes. If the yes is weak, it might be a one or a five. Yeah. If the yes is strong, it might be a nine or a 13. Wow. Okay. I and totally so understand what you're saying. Over about. those five categories, I'm using Fibonacci not only to get the answers, but the strength of those answers that give an overall score. 
and we hire from that. That's amazing, dude. That that makes a lot of sense. First yeah. time I heard you say that, I didn't understand because I'm yeah. I understood what Fibonacci is, but I, I didn't yeah. I didn't understand that. Now the other thing is, me as a founder, I'm having a hard time letting other people like edit my TikToks, edit my podcast. You know, like I'm really having a hard time. I do 100 percent of the fulfillment now. At some yep. point, that has got to stop. Right, I'm doing eight hours of calls a week plus my one on ones. Right. Uh, outsourcing what you're not good at. This is a great thing. Like I get my, the other partners in my company, they're like, "Man, we need you doing this instead." Right? right? We need you not wasting time doing this. We need you doing this. Can you talk about this? Uh, you know, doing the thing that you're best at and then outsourcing what you're not as good at, and the ego, the, like letting go of your ego to allow that to happen. Right. So that's that's a really really important thing. Another reason I think systems are so important, but. Uh, in my business, I don't, I don't really enjoy estimating, but I've created a spreadsheet that when the numbers are put in there correctly, then the numbers spit out correctly. And I really love looking over a deal. What I think is important is not only to look at what you're good at, but what you actually have an energy for. Cause a lot of times in your business, it's not what you will do or what you should do, but it's what you will do. And I actually hire around what I will do. Mm. I could be the world's best salesman, let's say. But if I fucking hate it and I'm not going to do it, I'll do it in the beginning. But when I, so, so I, I look at, um, let's say, what's the word for motivation or when you should, discipline, okay. discipline, right? If I hate sales, I'll sell, 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 sell until I can trade out revenue or resources for discipline, right? And then I'll go do what I should do. And most oftentimes for me, that is going out, being at those events, selling jobs, but not directly closing, things yeah. like that. So if they are telling you that you should be doing these other things, but you have this energy for that other thing, then man, I might would hire it. I don't, I don't yeah. know what particularly the subject is, but like, what is the likelihood of you doing it for that long of a period of time? Me and Brandon talked about this other day about discipline. He said, I don't know if I believe in discipline as much as I used to because I'm growing to find that the things that I actually do that make me successful, it's not work at all. It's it's what I wanna do. Yes. And I know that could be a just of, just of position when it comes to passion, but I think paying attention to what you have an energy for doing inside your business is different from creating a business that you're passionate about. Yeah, well, he becomes passionate about those things because he's been doing those videos for eight years. Right. So he's, he's really, really he gained the competency in order right. to do it. It wasn't one of these things. Like, you see a lot of guys, a lot of businesses get formed in the shower while you're by yourself, and right. then you get out there and you got to put them together, and all of a sudden it doesn't doesn't work out right. that well, right? I can't imagine doing the taxes for my own fucking company. Yeah, right. We're going to hire someone yeah, out. Shout absolutely. out to MJ. We're hiring yeah. somebody else to do that. That's It's exactly right. Um, working out in order to have energy. This is another great point. I, I saw right. this on your MA. I thought it was really interesting because a lot of people have this thing. I work out and then I'm tired. No, you're working out to get energy, right? right. Um, can you talk about that? Because there's a great book called Spark, and it talks about like, when people suffer from depression, the actual neurochemicals that you need, you can get them from taking certain chemicals, right? But they're not in the proper order because everybody's right. different. But if you go walk or play, dude, it is impossible for me to catch footballs and be de depressed, right? I play tight end also. It is impossible for me to catch footballs and be depressed. It is possible for me to shoot three-pointers and be depressed. It's impossible. Right. Can you talk about working out to get energy and also to change your mind state? Yeah, so I, some of the best days in my life are the days that I wake up early in the morning and the first thing I do is work out. Yeah. In fact, those are the best days. They're the days I'm most calm. They're the days that I, I feel like exercising is a form of meditation. Yes. Because if you have multiple plates... It, is, it on, is a form of meditation, 100%. Right, that you are never going to be more present than when that load is on your back and you're in a squat rack. Yes. It's, it's, not, it's not anything other than moving your body in a place and exhausting your body and the contrast between the sitting still and being relieved that it's over and the calm feeling that comes after it. I think that fitness, and when I say fitness, I mean exercise, is the most important thing a person could get right in their life because it makes everything else so substantially easier for them in every way. Their perception of themselves, their perceptions of how other people treat them and look at them the presence they have when they walk in a room and just overall the actual physical benefit of your headspace after you do it. I don't think there's anything more important. I really don't. All right. This is something I've been wanting to ask you about because I, this happens okay. all the time. Fucking Phylon and fucking 
they like these guys make these videos and they're like lining up and it's it it's so crazy to me that these guys are it, it feels like this dude they're specifically making videos of dudes who would beat the shit out of them does that make sense like especially with that file on dude from canada like who is this the, he made the okay do you remember the video about you did you ever see it, it was a reaction video to another guy named Phylon who made a video about you oh Philion. Philion, whatever i yeah, don't even yeah, know yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. name like uh, yeah yeah okay like, i can't imagine building an entire uh business off just hating other people right but like when i watch this and he like he he like he sits there and makes fun of people and i was like bro right, like, yeah you're making fun of people you would never say this to their face like, right, that's right. all i think about is like Bro, yeah. like I can't even. I like I. I make make one about me, but don't ever come right. to Vegas. I'm gonna tell you right now, don't come right. here. Right, and it's just it's just one of these crazy things where I watch it, and then the other one, like the guy, he he comes up to me in a in a, a nightclub in Vegas, and he starts like threatening me, and I'm looking at the GM like, bro, I will have you thrown into a fucking bathroom, and they won't ever right. find you again. What are right. you doing? And I, and I just remember thinking, I'm just gonna let this guy go, just go off, do whatever, and then he blames me for like getting arrested or something like that. Like, how do you, what do you think about that? Like, it, to me, you remember Natty or not with uh, Brandon Carter? He was like, I was uh, flattered when they did a Natty yeah. or not video about Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Because that meant, like, if, I, if nobody's even thinking, nobody's doing a Natty or not video about me. Right. right? If, if, when, you're, when you have guys like that, these, like, professional haters coming after right. you, do you find it flattering? What do you think about this whole thing? Man, I love it. Actually, um, I commented on Philion's video. Like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm a fan. I, I think the guy's actually very talented. Yeah, oh, I think he's talented, yeah. too. I'm just so confused why he yeah. makes, why he, he just goes after people like because this. Because his heart's broken, bro. Yeah. His heart's broken. He's got to hate a guy like me, man. Yeah. A guy like me has never been nice to him. Um, if he met me, he'd probably love me. But... He, well, let me take that back. He'd want to like me, and he would not be able to. And that's not, that's not for me to worry with. I'm apt, I hope he makes another one. I hope a bunch of people make them, especially the PUA guys. Um, I've noticed that a couple of PUA guys have made videos about me. Man, I love that shit. You know, I really do. Because I get too much pussy to be on the internet teaching guys how to <laughs> trick girls to get pussy. So please put my name out there, G. Please. I, um... Yeah, it's absolutely flattering, and I'm not mad a bit about it. Yeah, I'm not mad a bit because I know who I am. Right, I'm secure in myself. I, I absolutely um, don't mind acknowledging those videos that were made. People send them to me, and I'm like, yeah, I know. Ha -ha. Like, I truly, with all my heart, am not bothered by it, and hope, hope that they make more because Philion has damn near a million followers. Yeah, you know, um, and some of the other ones have really, really big followings. Good. Good. So, man, for me, um, I, lo I, love, I love when they do it. Um, in fact, that particular video that Feline made, every point he made, I actually watched it. Me and Sterling watched it together. Yeah. We laughed our ass off because I absolutely stand by everything I said. Like, he cut it and he spoke about it. I'm like, no. No, I completely agree. I wouldn't. I wouldn't let my girl have guy friends and go on girls trips. Sure. Fuck that shit. Like, <laughs> like, no, absolutely. In fact... Philion, please send your girl on a girl's trip to Vegas while I'm here, cowboy. Yeah. I'll beat the brakes off her ass. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. So I love it, man. Like, please make more videos about me. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I saw that too. And again, I agree with you. I saw talent. And then I'm like, man, your so whole talented. business model is based off hating other people. He's so talented. And he's funny as fuck. Yeah, he is. And I like, super but, talented. But that's what makes it so disappointing. Honestly, yeah, that yeah. because like, what, where's the, like, and I know he'll be like, well, I'm not interested in money. I'm like, right. you can't sell a product. There's no coaching product here. There's right. no, there's no product. There's right. no merchandise. You, what are you going to do here? You're you, I don't care what you say. And I don't care if he sees this and comes after me. Good. You have built a business of hate. Right. No matter what you think, that is right. all you have, bro. You have built. That is the only yep. knob that you have turned up to 99 is hate, bro. And it's like, it's one of these situations where it's like, I can't imagine doing that. Are there things that uh, some guys, the guests that I've had on the show, I disagree with all the time. It happens all the fucking time. Right. Time. I, or things I could never do. Me and Dan right. do not see women the same way. We see similar, right. but we 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 don't see things exactly the same way. Right. And and me and Andrew don't either. Like you know what I'm saying. We talked about this. So so it's the thing is, but I would never not want them to be successful or like make right. it a personal thing. You know what I'm saying. If I didn't agree with what they said, so I thought that was interesting. You know what, what Andrew would say about that guy? Mm -hmm. And I completely agree with this. If you were to take that platform away from him, he's nothing. Oh, agreed. Nothing. And if you were to put Andrew in the same room with him, he's right. nothing. He would run the fucking other way. Right. So for me, you could take all of my 
all of my YouTube and my social media away from me, I'm still me. What a great point. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? What a great point. Yeah. And so a lot of these guys that have these platforms and they sit behind and they troll guys, I'm cool in real life, motherfucker. At the end of the day, you know, you can, you could take all this social media stuff away. You know, I'd still be friends with you. That's a good friend to have, right? I'd still be friends with Andrew. That's a good friend to have. Yeah. Where does that come from? That comes from some level of respect based off of value created out in the world. So I'm still me at the end of the day. Guys like that, they lose that platform. They've lost everything, including their whole identity. Yeah. And that is a broken man. Was it, uh, I don't, forgot it was you or someone else said that uh, the reason why Andrew feels the ability to say whatever he wants to say is because no matter what happens, he still has Tristan. It was me. Yeah, it was, it was, it was the first time I met Andrew. It was actually here in Las Vegas. It was down the road from here. And it was, it was a question I had because I was using the war room in a lot of ways to help me deal with guilt and suppression. Mm. And so I'm like, okay, he says, like, I want to know what it is that makes him feel confident and, and comfortable saying certain things that are hard to say, but actually very, very, very true. And dude, we must have been like this close yeah. when I asked him that. Just how the conversation, the room was kind of crowded. We were kind of having our own conversation together in a crowded room. And I said, what is it? And he looked me dead in the eye and he says, no matter what happens in this world, I have Tristan. Wow. And that was very powerful for me. And in a way that made, I think, he and I closer over time. And so I know that they could take all my shit down tomorrow or something could happen to my business or anything. And I know he would have my back and vice versa. So um, I think that's a very powerful thing. And that's why I think brotherhood is so important in so many ways. And I think Andrew taught me that in a way that I had known before but forgotten because I, I was thinking to myself, right, I, I, it wasn't even that long ago. When was I most happy in my life other than now? Mm. College football. Yeah, there you go. I was about to say the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Because, because you have this, what are you, all, all you're doing is lifting weights, trying to hypothetically take over the world in some way. Nobody's telling you what to do. You get to be big and be strong, and you can call it toxically masculine and all that, but you were, you were loyal. You had, you had people six. You, you were on a mission together, and, and women would come and go, but that wasn't the main focus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in a lot of ways, I feel the same way now. It's just the goal is a little bit different. Yeah. So um, guys like that, they have nothing like that in their life. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, no, you bring yeah. it, like I said before, the guy who keyed my car, I was like, I'd rather be the person get my car keyed Absolutely. than the person out there keying a car. For me, yeah. for me, the happiest point was the 11 hour missions over Afghanistan. Like that was, right. the, to me, because I'm in there with the crew and we're just telling jokes and the boom operator falls asleep and we draw dicks on his face. Like right. that, that yeah. was the camaraderie, yes. dude, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Those, those are the fun times, man. But that, that is really interesting. And then also the other part was um, the idea of just the pickup artists in general, like not really being able to back up some of the things that they're saying. I, I usually, for me, I've said this before, I'm not misogynistic because it's not just because I love women. I'm not misogynistic because it's a bad game. Right. It's actually bad. It actually doesn't work. And right. so that, that's the reason why I do that. And I see a lot of pick up PUAs and they're like, so much of the, what they're doing is let's, let's teach these girls a lesson. And I'm like, I'm not here to teach nobody yeah. a lesson, man. Because here's the thing, right? What do 10% of men get 90, 60% of the right swipes on Tinder? What do you think it was like? 2000 years ago, right. it's the same way. Nothing's Absolutely. going to change. You're not going to change it. I'm sorry, incels, sorry, McDowell. You're not going to yeah. change it. It's just going to be like this forever. So join the club, like be, be part of that group. Can you talk about this before? Cause I have heard you say this before about, you said it in your AMA about PUAs, about what, they, what they've been doing. Yeah, man, so to me, it's not the individual PUA itself that I have a problem with. It's the problem I have is telling men, particularly young men that there is a cheat code that it is not required to build yourself, your body, your finance, your competency, and yourself as a human being. And that there is this other pill on the side, which is some sly words to a woman, most often words that are probably going to make her feel less about herself yeah. in order to manipulate someone into sleeping with you. It's hollow. It's going to leave you absolutely wrecked. And it's not healthy for you or the woman particularly. So to me, I don't like to talk about 
things to say to girls to get them to sleep with you or like make videos particularly about picking up women. I like to talk when I talk about women or, or brag about how many women you sleep. That's right. Another thing. I, right. I, I, yeah. That's lame. Like, it, like, dude, if, if I have to run around and tell you how many women I've slept with and I'm probably not even sleeping with women because I don't have time for that shit. Yeah, I really don't. If you were this in real life, you don't feel insecure enough to tell other men that you're sleeping with all these girls. Like, dude, I actually do it in real life. Yeah. So when I talk about women or about creating a better relationship with women or making women like you, it's very often tied to something that's going to make you a better man, not something to trick and manipulate the woman. And I think that's my issue with PUA in general. So if there's a guy out there teaching how to get women, I don't have a problem with that particularly. It's the pickup artist. It's, it's the only art in pickup is the art of picking up yourself. The end. That's it. So that's how I feel about that subject, man. I think it's it's broken for the man and broken for the woman. Nice. Uh, you also talked about well, you have a. This is something that's come up to me a lot. Uh, you'll have a guy friend, yeah, uh, and they hang around and they have, um, you know, their girl is constantly seeing you be funny around other pretty girls, making money, living a good life, and they, then he and her are fighting. And I warn my guy friends about this all the time, like. As you come up, it's going to be the girls of the guy friends that are close to you that are going to like try to build this connection with you that's like unhealthy. Like I, I tell my guy friends this sometimes, like you're going to have a situation where some girl that's dating one of your friends is, like hits on you. You can never take that opportunity. It seems right. so easy, and if you don't have abundance, you will. Right. Which is why abundance is so incredible. You actually said the word pussy desert. Like yeah. that if you don't have abundance, then you're going to do this and you gain nothing, bro. You gain nothing from this. Like you, you're, it, and it's. I, there's a girl I'm dating right now who's very famous, and if people knew about it, I would just make my life harder. It would just right. fucking make my life harder. I don't even tell the, those people. Do you, in this situation, do you, have, do you have rules when it comes to this? You said before, you know if someone's your friend, leave them with your, uh, your bank account and your girl. Yeah. Right? Is that how, is that how you determine who your friends are? Yeah. It, it, first of all, I, I think I said this earlier, but if a man doesn't have his money right in his situation with women right, if mm. he's not in abundance of money and women, we're probably not going to be friends. Right. Because what's going to end up happening is at some point over money or women, you're going to be desperate. It could be as simple as not being as accountable as me for picking up the group's bill. You know, like if you freeload too much. Or it could be like going behind my back and screwing me out of a deal. You know, in regards to a woman... It's, it's the same thing. I'll, I'll give an example. Let's say got two guys that grew up together. They're best friends all the way throughout life. One guy gets married. Slowly that guy starts to fall off. They, they get a divorce. And then the only person that his friend has a tight relationship with, that is a woman, is his wife because yes. they used to all hang out together. Yes. And so now he gets this layup, which she's going to do to piss off the ex-husband. He thinks he's going to have her now, but he ain't shit. And so he ends up losing a friend he had for 30 years over 30 seconds of pussy because he doesn't have morals and ethics. And that's why I believe that morals and ethics are to be taken seriously before you need them. Yeah. Because scenario two is he does have women and he has so many women that all he can do is take pride in how good of a friend he is by telling her to kick fucking rocks. Yeah. And that's, and that's kind of like... I would love, and I do love nothing more than to find out that somebody that one of the guys used to see likes me or sends me a DM on mm -hmm. Instagram, and I screenshot him like, you know this one? We do this all day. Hey, you got this one? Yeah, three years ago. Tell her to fuck off. I'm like, sweet, got you. Andrew said you're an asshole. Fuck off. Wow. And the girl's like a straight 10, straight 10. And I know in my heart that the 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 – the happiness I get from telling that beautiful woman to fuck off, I get it because I know that there are very, very few men in this world that will be able to do it. Yeah. And we all really, really appreciate that about one another is that if you've ever gone on a date, spoken to, if, if y'all ever had any, but we just don't because we're all in such abundance. We don't have to. And I, I think that's something really, really awesome that um, doesn't get talked about as far as being able to give something to a ma male friend. I, you mark my words. If I go to that pool party with you tomorrow and some 10 out of 10 playmate walks up to me 
And I look at her Instagram and you follow her and I ask you and you're like, we went on a coffee date seven years ago. Bro, you can, I will tell that bitch to kick fucking rocks, G. No, it's code, bro. I appreciate that, but no. you, you're, you're more than and, welcome. And I would say, fuck you. I would say, fuck you, because, because, because that's, that's just, that's how we do it. No, for sure. That's how we do it. Yeah. it it's, it's ruthless. Yeah. And I think, I think it's ruthless because we actually like it because... It's something. It's something sacrificial we can do for one another that for we sure. know other men would. Nice. Do. Okay, I see so, that. I see that. And, and I think that's a beautiful thing about. Hey, it. Hey man, you're clearer than hot on all of them. All right, listen. Yeah. Tomorrow, I'll tell you right now. So here's the thing. Um, I want to ask you about this. So the gentleman game, right? Yeah. There's different levels, right? Sure. And so you you guys are not all the same. You guys see things a little bit differently. And the re re reason I want to contrast this is. These guys have built an incredible podcast, Fresh and Fit, like an yeah. incredibly like huge following. I some I don't hear gentlemen game from them sometimes. Uh, do you guys ever contrast with your beliefs when it comes to like how how you treat women? Do you ever have debates about this? Uh, me and Myron and Walt don't particularly. I actually think Myron and Walt are heroes. Um, I've said this many times. I think they they show the polarity that's needed in in female nature. Yes, and you say you say yeah. because they show extreme examples. They, of they it. show yes. extreme, so it creates this average for the guy that's a super simp. Yeah, but I don't think that's. The Myron and Fresh that you see on the show, mm -hmm. I don't. I think that is the entertainer, money making side of yeah. Of I've, those I've two. text Fresh before. He's a right. really cool guy. Yeah. So what I think that who they are with women in privacy are probably completely different. They work so much that we don't get to hang out as often. Mm. Um, but I suspect because of their intelligence level that they're not like calling them hoes and bitches and saying open the door and cover dinner. They don't have to, number one. You know, so um, my, we've, never, we've never really talked about it in depth. Yeah. I just genuinely, based off their intelligence level and their income and their ability to get women, think that they don't have to act that way. I yeah. think that's for the show. That's, that's my The that's show my is, like, because they're dealing with something that is so fundamental to human existence, which right. is the attraction between men and women, the show never runs out of material and is always captivating. Regardless of how much you really like me. them or do, don't Red like me. them, the reality of the situation is they are, it's not a fundamental function of evolutionary psychology. It is the most fundamental right. function, which is status in men and sexual selection in general. Right. And so that's the reason why I think they can just, like they could do that forever. The, I, think, I think where I'm a little different is that like, I'm not a crusader. I, I don't care if the girl figures out that she's gonna be unhappy. Go be right. unhappy. I don't really give a shit. Right. Do whatever you want. I have a friend of mine. She's making like four hundred grand a month on OnlyFans, like having sex with transsexuals and fucking midgets. I'm like, right, whatever. Like, do I'm not going to change. What am I going to do? I'm going to change her. I don't yeah, fucking yeah. care. And like, she comes on my podcast and I get a bunch of new subscribers. Okay, cool. Like, I'm, I'm a yeah. fine. Go ahead, do whatever you want to. Do. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying. Man. Like, be free. To be each free. Own. To each their own. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the other thing. Like, I, 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 I don't. For me. The guys who listen to this podcast, guys like you, who are already accepting of, of this type right. of ideology, for me, my my information is for you guys. I am not going to go on public forums. Like, congrat. Like, what they're doing is awesome. Like what you said before. Right. You think you, um, uh, I, I I don't. That's not a hill I want to die on. The the thing is like wh when when I see that happen to me, the guys in MOA they get everything from me. Those are my those. Just like you probably feel the same way about the guys in the war room yeah. or or t t uh, Andrew and. Uh, and, and Tristan, where even if you have an unpopular opinion, you're going to share that with them, right. and it doesn't make any difference. For me, it's like, it's like my guys, in, those are the only guys I give a fuck about are the ones in that circle. Do you understand what I'm right. saying? And that's how I kind of, I maybe got that from being in a military unit or being on a football team. You know, right. That's probably where some, where some of that came from. Um, here's the thing. Biggest beliefs you've had to change since you got involved in this whole community? Hmm, that's actually a really good question. You know, since, since I came into the space, I didn't I didn't plan to get into the space. Yeah, really, it was it was always something I wanted to do in regards to to doing YouTube and and other things like that. Um, the the biggest, would you say the biggest truth? The biggest. So the biggest belief you had to change. Like I, I heard uh, Rich. Oh, what's the gentleman's name? Or oh, Cooper? Is that yeah. Name? He was talking about the lies you learned. I don't even want to call them lies. I don't even. Oh, I, I, are I you talking about like the industry of doing this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, like, I, or the industry or just in general, the things that you had to change that maybe Disney. Because I don't even think it's like on purpose. I think people are just negligent. 
right? They, they say what they want to believe, and then you end up like believing in things that aren't true. Uh, do, what are the, the changes? For me, it was just like, I, I used to manage a strip club. I've told uh -huh. some people this. Yeah. Watching the prettiest girls at the strip club just be treated like dog shit by the same dudes over and over again, and then later on, that same dude is dating another pretty girl at the strip right. club, and just being like, oh, oh, this is not what they taught me at church. Oh shit! This is not. Oh, yeah. oh wait, this is a little different than that Hallmark but, card. And then so I, these are the beliefs that I, I had to change. You, yeah, I will tell you. I, the biggest belief that changed for me is that if you sit a girl down that truly cares about you, mm. and you do treat her correctly, and you treat her like a gentleman, and you respect her, and you look her in the eyes and say, hey, "Look, I really care about you, but I am going to sleep with other women," that she would leave. They will absolutely stay. They will stay. And I think that was one of the most impactful paradigm shifts in my life because what it did is it allowed me to love people even deeper. Mm. And so I'll give an example. Let's say, you, let's say you're with a girl and, and you, you have strong feelings for her. You might block off that last 25% of your heart because you don't want her to know that there's this natural innate thing inside of you that makes you want to sleep with other women. Yeah. And you're scared that if you tell the truth and you show who you are and you take off that mask, that she will leave. If you've done the work on yourself and you're that level and status of a guy, or it, let's just say if she actually loves you, because normally that's what it takes, status, and she'll actually love you, so she'll stay. But if you can get to the point where you can say, hey, listen, I'm about to tell you the truth, and she stays, then you don't have to worry about hiding that thing behind your back and you can actually fully love somebody and really give them the rest of you, you know, who Agreed. you are. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and so I think that's true in everything. It, it, you could, you could say the same thing if there's something that you think you're hiding in your life. And just because you assume somebody's not going to like it, it could be a man, you know, might not, it would cer certainly not be romantically, but it could be in work and business. Hey, I feel this way about this because I believe business goes like this or mm -hmm. that. Um, and you can knock that down. That's why I think it's so important to drop politics in an office. You know, For sure, yeah. Same thing. Yeah. And, and you can fully communicate and function from there. And for that, I believe, lifts a, a burden off of you like nothing else. And if you're lighter, man, you can fly higher. I tell my salespeople, we're absolutely not going to put one single word in this sales copy that I cannot fully verify, either right. with video or pictures. Not exactly. a single fucking thing, because I want to be able to sleep at night. So I totally agree with what you're saying. Yeah. That, that, that is what an incredible realization. For me, I tend to find women who are bisexual, and that ends up like, oh, you like her? I like her also. That ha right. that, that's helpful. I don't ever have to worry about that conversation. But you're right, man. What a, what a great belief, and like what a hard right. thing. I was, I'll, I'll, I'll take you one step further. I was with a, with a girl for over two years, and I told her that on her second date. I was like, hey, I'm not going to have a traditional monogamy with, with you. And this girl is pheno phenomenal, incredibly beautiful, huge social media influencer, and then she, um, and just a wonderful person. And she, uh, and she, I expected her to leave. She did not. We were together for over two years, and I truly believe this, and she may disagree, that if I had strictly committed to her, she would have left. She would have had a hard time respecting you probably. She would have left. Yep. I always, I absolutely believe that. Um, and so that's hard. Like a lot of women are going to hear that and be like, fuck, like, what do I do with that? Or maybe just not right. believe me. But yeah, man, it's, it's a, it's a really interesting dichotomy. Um, Hey man, last thing you, uh, getting, this is the biggest thing. People giving themselves permission. You ever watch Wes Watson? We went to prison. The dude went to prison no, for 10 never years. Seen him. Bro, watch Wes Watson. All right, let's check just him out. crazy. Like bodybuilder yeah. got out of prison. He talked about like, you know, white people can only fight white people in prison and they, like everything segregated. And he talked about like how you hide shit in prison and, right. and he, and he, he teaches a fitness program. Anyway, he's the best example I've ever seen of someone giving themselves permission and just not giving a shit about being politically yeah. correct. He's a absolutely fantastic at his program. And when I have clients that are having trouble with that, I've, and my screaming at him, it isn't enough. Then I'll send them like, dude, I want you to watch him. Wes Watson videos, right? Yeah. Wes, is, Wes is incredible. I'll check them out. Yeah, please dude. You're, it's, it's crazy. Um, you don't have this concern for what people think about you. Uh, Andrew and Tristan don't either. I imagine Sterling's the same way. The, the, the guys on Fresh and Fit certainly do not. Yeah. Where do you get that from? Because that, that is going to be a key for a lot of people watching this. How do I gain that ability to not really care when I know what I'm going to say is very unpopular? Because I have those guys. It's the same right. thing with Andrew and Tristan. What Andrew told me, we've now created in a group. And, I, and honestly, I feel that way about Myron and Walt. Like, so there could be people, 
for my hometown that absolutely hate me, but they could all hate me. Everybody on my Facebook can hate me. In fact, I purposely let my Instagram funnel into my Facebook just to probably even overcorrect about my inability to not care in the past because I feel like I lived an entire life full of suppression. And I always say that suppression is most often wrapped in love. They come to you and they want you to be smaller and they want you to do less and they don't want you to leave your hometown and they don't want you to do big things and they wrap it in love because they're worried about you. But what you're really doing is threatening the reality of the fact that they chose to be small in their life. And if you go do something bigger, you're threatening their life decisions. And that's very, very scary. So for me, I now have people in my life and I had to go find them that not only want me to win, but want me to win big. And there's no cap on it and there's no insecurity behind it. So I don't have to worry what people think of me because I have a family. And, and those guys act in that way. We get to all pull for each other and we want nothing more to see each other win. So I don't really give a fuck what anybody outside of that small, small group thinks about me because I don't have to. So. That's, That's incredible, man. What a, a great piece of advice, man. I, I'm telling you, for a lot of people that are stuck in their own head, that's, that's worth the price of admission, right? Yeah. Just being able to get over that one thing. I'm like, hey, you know, President Trump fucked a woman, a porn star, while his wife was pregnant, still got right. elected. You know, yep. President Clinton had sex with an intern, and his yep. approval rating went up. You know what right. I'm saying? President, <laughs> President Kennedy was sleeping with Marilyn Monroe, right. and everyone freaking knew about it. Mm -hmm. And you're worried, like, like Caitlyn Jenner ran over someone when she was drunk right. and won Woman of the Year, and you're worried about the fucking meme that you're posting on your Instagram today. Right. Maybe you should care a little bit less because nobody even noticed you, noticed you exist right now, and you're so concerned with what other people think about you. Right. Yeah, man, awesome, man. I really appreciate that. Hey, man, thank you guys for joining us. I really appreciate Justin coming all the way out here from Miami to do this. Uh, we got a fun weekend planned. Uh, guys, man, I'm, I'm telling you, thank you once again on Apple and uh, Spotify. The, the, the downloads have doubled. And again, I really, really appreciate that. Uh, the number of guests that have reached out to me, I'm, 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 dude, I'm booked up. We got the next 20 guests booked up. Uh, this is actually, I believe, going to be 52. So this is one year that I've been doing this podcast. So I want to say thank you guys so much for, uh, for helping me out and doing this uh, one year. No, this is episode 53. So it's been over a year that I've been able to do this. And I just want to say thank you guys for the support, all the, the things that you've sent me, all the people who have come up and like, but by the way, if you guys want to take pictures with me when we're out in public and I'm on a date, please do it. You're absolutely fully welcome to go do that. It's pretty, I bet you, you, you feel it's the same flex. way, Justin. It's a flex, bro. I yeah, bet yeah, you, Justin, yeah, yeah. feels the same hey, you way. Come talk to me anytime for you sure. want. For sure. Yeah. Justin, I'm a huge fan of yours. Can we take a picture? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Yes. No whenever, problem. Whenever I'm on a date, you're I'll hug more, you. more than welcome. Let's take several pictures. Yep. Guys, I want to say thank you. Justin, where can they find you? You can find me on Instagram, jwaller7. From there, I'm going to send you to an email list and to the War Room and Hustlers University, especially if you want any help from me directly. That's where you can find me. So Jay Waller seven on Instagram and you'll see everything else from there. Beautiful man. You guys definitely check him out. He's got a bunch of great uh, reels uh, on, on Instagram that are really great. And his YouTube channel is also fantastic guys. Thank you so much for joining us and I will see you all next week. Ooh.